Nerds, happy Wednesday to you. Uh, I got up early this morning for this show, so uh, this is something obviously that's special to me, is that we're kind of diving deeper into a variety of different topics today. Um, last week, unfortunately, we got put in timeout, um, so it was kind of new news to us, kind of last minute as well, so we apologize for that. Uh, from what I understand, uh, the whole you know FCP1 was in a timeout for, for a week. Just the same way it happens on Instagram, I guess that happens on YouTube. I didn't even know uh, you could be suspended for that long. Uh, so kind of moving forward with that kind of stuff, you know, we've uh, we've reached out uh, to all of the people that uh, helped with Heather and her, um, uh, you know, her, her seed fundraiser and that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you didn't receive your seeds in America, uh, you should have. So please reach out to me. There were three people in Canada that the seeds went out today to Peter. Um, and then Peter's going to send those out because he knows how to do that the, the proper way. So all of that back housekeeping, uh, Ken, that kind of threw me off there, man. I was in, in my zone. So you want to promote your uh, your tour? Uh, no, actually, no. I was uh, switching brands in the background and DP had a bunch of stuff on my brand page. It wasn't supposed to come up, brother. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So obviously Ken, Ken's doing stuff behind the scenes. There's a lot of different shows. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff uh, going on with FCP and hopefully uh, we don't violate any things again. And, uh, you know, we don't get put in time out. Uh, so I want to give it out to my co-host, uh, Mr. Marco. Uh, you know, this is, again, one of my shows that one of the, the shows that I feel like, buddy, you know, coming out here, driving out here, seeing the countryside. Uh, there's just something special to this place. And so I, I'm excited to kind of hopefully sh share with our audience what really goes on in some of these uh, soil soil places in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited about this one, too. Um, uh, Bart Peonia, good good to see you, man. Uh, for everybody that doesn't know uh, Bart, I've known him for a little over a year now. We, um, we were all out in Oklahoma doing a um, the Hustle and Learn uh, Hustle and educate. Yeah. Hustle and oh, educate. Yeah. That's right. And uh, so we were out there hustling and educating. So um, much respect for Bart, someone who knows his stuff, knows his soil. Thank and you, Marco. This, yeah, definitely. This is going to be a real treat, guys, as far as um, digging in, learning kind of what the larger scale operations do, what it, you know, what it takes to kind of get to that size and that scale and keep that quality. It's kind of a big thing. So um, you guys know how we do. We just get into it. So with that said, why don't you jump in, give us a little intro for the people that don't know you. And well, I wanted to highlight I wanted to highlight some of it, the things that he's been working okay. on just this year, Marco. Um, so, you know, obviously people have been using his soil from, from a cannabis aspect, but there's large institutions that are using his soil right here in Colorado. Uh, some really big names. If you're from Colorado or maybe have visited Colorado. So like the Denver, Denver Botanical Gardens, you know, they're picking Bart's brain on, on ways to improve their, their aspects. The U.S. Department of Ag, the Cherry Creek Mall. So, you know, I, I've, I go there with my, uh, my kids probably two or three times a month. Um, so you guys know how beautiful the Cherry Creek Mall is. Uh, the city of Grand Junction and then the Aspen Art Museum, which I, um, I kind of wanted to start off with that one, because from what I understand, that was more of a kind of like a fun project, too. It was really cool. Uh, you know, we're, we're in Western Colorado. We're kind of halfway between Aspen and Telluride. And, uh, there was an artist over there that wanted to do a living, living art installation on the roof of the Aspen art museum. And they knew about us. We do a lot of work in the Aspen area and, uh, uh, yeah, it was just really cool to see what could happen. Um, when somebody takes, takes their artistic effort. And I think that's on our Instagram some pictures of that installation, but takes the effort and doesn't just want to um, uh, make it pretty using chem newts. They were dedicated to having this be organic because of the kind of um, uh, ethic behind the installation and how it was trying to educate people and how there are different ways to do things. And yeah, we, we really enjoyed being part of that project. And the, the Denver uh, Botanical Gardens, for those who have never seen that, I mean, that is almost uh, like a must must visit type thing on all the, the visiting websites, Colorado visiting websites and that kind of thing. So I find it remarkable that I got the man right here where, you know, they're picking his brain on how to improve things. From what I understand, things have been declining 
uh, at the Botanical Gardens, which is obviously a no-no uh, when everybody's coming to see the big, beautiful colors um, on a variety of different plants, usually in a very small space. So uh, let's kind of dive deeper into that as well, Bart, and how you're able to manage that and educate that to their team so that they can kind of like pass that on because uh, the information is almost like telephone sometimes where, you know, you pass it on to the head grower, he passes it on and it seems like sometimes it's missed. So how That's are it. you able to really take that to the next level with those guys? Yeah. And so we're working at the Chatfield Farms location of the Botanic Gardens. They've got several locations. There's the obviously the York Street downtown Denver, but Chatfield Farms is a, a, a pretty big farm that they run out um, out kind of uh basically west of Denver there um, and kind of in the southwest area. Uh, and it's a, a really historic ranch and they put out hundreds of CSAs a day in the summer for low income families. So like vegetable food shares, things like that. And uh, and so, you know, we took a look at some of their soils tests there and we're able to pretty quickly identify some problems and uh this is i guess a good a good way to segue into some of the stuff i see with these soils tests but um you know there's kind of two worlds i feel like there's the chem newt people who are running salts and when they're doing that on any sort of a scale outside i mean it's one thing when you're in your in your 10 by 10 and you've you know, you've got all the cocoa organic matter you want, but outdoors, um, really running salts, especially nitrate salts, I have found to just burn the organic matter out of soil and leave you with like a 1% organic matter clay or less sometimes. Um, and that, that activity really, I feel like is driven by the bacterial microorganisms. And so, you know, we know when we're making compost or something, you need a, like a 20 to one or 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio um, because those uh, thermophiles, those composting microbes want to consume um, any of the nitrogen and use carbon to process it and vice versa. If there's extra nitrogen, we'll use carbon to process it. And so um, when you have excess nitrates in your soil in the fall and the winter, which if you run salts, you're going to have excess nitrate in the soil, then, um, then all those bacterial organisms are in your soil, chewing up carbon, literally burning the carbon out of your soil and leaving you with a, with a heavy clay. And that's why all these sports fields, you end up seeing them just super hard clay, all the hay farmers out here, super hard clay. Um, and then, then you've got the flip side. And this is what we ran into at the Botanic Gardens. There's all these organic farms and they're treating their soil well and they've got higher organic matter. But what, what uh, I see at so many organic farms is potassium toxicity um, that comes from over compost application. And so I feel like that's one of the things we could really uh, lend to Chatfield Farms is saying, hey guys, you've done a great job with this compost, but, but you've gone too far and now you're potassium toxic. They're in the thousands of parts per million of potassium, and that's just that's just gonna end up with a bunch of plant health problems. So, um, yep, that, that's a lot of what we did there. And then we really went through all their um, trace mineral holes. They had some deficiencies in zinc and manganese. We tuned their calcium and magnesium a little bit, and then gave them a, a whole bunch of amino based nitrogen and uh, and all as well as pH adjustment in Denver right now, anyone that's on Denver city water, which they are, the Denver city water is running um, pH nine. Wow. And they're doing that for lead, lead pipe um, health mitigation issues. But um, Denver is just going to get browner and browner and browner over the next few years as that alkalinity rises. And so um, I really feel like it's critical for people in Denver in particular to be um, adding citric acid or some sort of acid to their water supply um, and potentially their irrigation water. So with those components, we were able to get um, Chatfield's Farms yields up significantly, healthier plants, 
higher yields in the first year that we started doing this farm scale custom nutrient blend for them. And we do that for a lot of our, our customers. A lot of people don't necessarily know that we do that, but at this point, yeah, we, we, uh, we provide custom nutrients for municipalities all the way to, to, to some very large farms. So you guys will take it from uh, kind of testing and then adding in the nutrients that are necessary, the whole remediation process. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, and, that, and that's that's kind of maybe where I differ from an Elaine Ingham type person or something. I mean, I agree with all her work on biology, and I think if you've got all the time in the world, the microbes can build that fertility. But in the real world, you have to make stuff happen this year, and so. That's the first thing I do when I come in is try to get the mineralization set right. And then I'll work on the biology. Do you, so in that first scenario where you said the clay, you know, kind of the carbon had been chewed out of the soil. Um, now you're left with kind of that sticky clayish um, con consistency. Um, what do you do on like on the, on the physical side, as far as I understand you're doing the, you know, chemical remediation, but are you doing physical, you know, adding in, you know, different, um, maybe aggregates or substrates to the soil as well? Definitely. And it really comes down to people's budgets. I mean, if you've got a field that's missing organic matter and they've got the money to throw core or peat or something at it, then great. That's a superior product. But most people aren't going to have that kind of budget. And we're working with um, some really tight budgets and trying to basically do magic. So a lot of time these days for the organic matter side of things, I'm using sawdust. Okay. And it's, it's kind of crazy. And everyone will be like, oh, nitrogen lockout. That's the first big thing. So obviously you can't be using sawdust without um, a nitrogen source, additional supplemental nitrogen source. And once again, I'm really into amino-based nitrogens. Mm -hmm. um, been using them for almost 30 years. I don't like the salts. And, and some of the big negatives I find with salts, and I've seen the research show, you know, you get this cell stretching effect. Do you get a bigger plant maybe out of that? Sure. But the cell wall is thinner and weaker. And so the pests and pathogens are going to have an easier time mm -hmm. attacking it. Also, you have um, a boron stripping effect. And so, you know, I feel like the, the research I've seen shows that boron is one of the most critical elements for plant immune health. And so in this way, you can see there's a double gut punch from um, the boron stripping with immune health and the cell wall stretching, all caused by nitrates let alone the fact that it then kills all your fungal organisms or a lot of them, um, you know, and then you're left without organic matter and the organic matter is the water holding capability of your soil. And so, you know, if you're, if you're down at 1% organic matter and I can use some sawdust to get someone up to 2% organic matter, there's a 300% increase in the water holding capability of the soil. And in a time when we've got the environmental conditions we have, when the planet's going where it is, to me, I just it just seems insane to me to be dumping more nitrates in, which then washes off in the red tides, and we burn organic matter out of our soil, and it's just another way we're going in the wrong direction instead of the right direction. So I love that the organic farms, all they've, they've all got like 6% organic matter, and that's what I consider optimal but they get there with the compost and yeah. you know um i've got a theory this is an interesting question for you guys and we'll see if your theory matches my theory but uh uh i was wondered like why would compost be out of ratio i really believe in albrecht's ratios of minerals and uh and and most composts are kind of like a one two three in my in my uh experience you know and of course your feed stocks will vary that a little but really across the vegan compost the chicken compost i tend to find that ratio holds true of a really high potassium in compost and not enough nitrogen and uh and wondered if you guys have ever thought about that or anything i mean i have um i think because the nitrogen that's in compost is so um easily I think it's easily consumed. It's readily available. 
to all the microbiology. And I think it probably gets converted to a different um, substance quicker or a different kind of compound, if you will. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's a, it is a great question. I kind of thought about it. And, I, you know, now that we're thinking about it, it kind of leads to more questions. So, um, you know, I make a lot of, um, I use a lot of Bokashi in my compost, for example. All right. So I'll turn wood chips in the soil by using a lot of food scraps, Bokashi food scraps. Now, the Bokashi is usually high in salt um, because, um, because of the food scraps. So you have to watch that. But um, Bokashi is really good at turning wood, you know, chips into soil and they do it really fast. And I think it's because, you know, the Bokashi is pre pre-composted, obviously. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, the microbiology really gets in there faster. So I don't know. I feel like in compost in general, things that are easier to consume and easier for the microbes to, you know, to eat, you know what I mean, um, are going to go out of balance quicker. That makes sense. I don't know. For what sure. You... Well, I, I think too, like the that ratio one, two, three. I mean, that's more, in my opinion, that's the that's for, for the flower. So the, the plant is gonna be weak as you're putting that on. You need some kind of like fungal aspects. You know, the, the ratio back in the day for to keep it really simple when we first started was three, two, one to one, two, three. You know, you're you're keeping your nitrogen higher, uh, potassium and uh, phosphorus lower. Um, and then obviously that switches. So if that's all that's being fed, I think uh, potentially also, you know, if you're going heavy with, you've mentioned this before, Bart, with like the biochar. So now you have kind of not enough. Then you have the biochar there. The alpha starts to emerge. The debos, as we like to call them, Marco, uh, they're out there taking everybody's chain. And so as time progresses, it's not the diversity that we once thought we might have had. Um, and, and then when we're not feeding it properly, I just don't think it has the strength. Um, also, when you're a beginner farmer, you don't, you don't have the calcium there either. So the, the plant's probably really struggling to just really, you know, start to, to build that process. Um, so you got to focus on that blueprint. And I think ratios do matter. At least you need to start to understand those ratios. I know we say trust the process and that kind of thing. But yeah, if your compost is out of whack or you're using a compost that might have too much like guanos or something that you maybe you know, maybe you don't add the blood meals and the guanos and the, and you, and the first time when you're doing compost, you know, you try to keep it super simple. Um, that's where I see a lot of people also mess up, Bart, when they watch Dr. Lane Ingham videos, they start to do their own composting. They think they need to add 62 amendments. Um, and then, of course, things go anaerobic or things are too hot. So uh, too many mistakes, I think, can be made when you're first starting to learn the, the composting process. That's why I'm a huge advocate of always talking about vermicomposting, letting the worms do it for you. Awesome. Yeah. yeah and another thing to that. add to that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, bro. Well, it's all, uh, uh, it's all part of that process, and it's all how we get here. And the wacky thing that came to me, and I don't know any way to prove this a few years ago, is that I realized, okay, a lot of these composts are manure-based, and in any ecosystem, you're going to have the animals, and that's what is I feel like is a little bit missing in a lot of this stuff. The animals that made the manure in a, in a primitive farm, you would have the bones and you would have the, the skin and the hide, and that's all pure amino nitrogen. And once I like kind of started taking the meat component back into it all, and I'm sure the vegans are going to lose it on me here today, but um, <laughs> I like, oh, wow. I, I really feel like the meat is what's missing. Like in the forest, when animals die, their bodies fall down and that's all pure high quality, like the, the bone meal you mentioned or, or the feather meal or the fish bone meal that I like to use. Um, these, these high nitrogen meat components, I feel like are really what kept compost in ratio in nature. And that's what we're missing a lot when we bring in a truckload of feedstocks mix up this big batch of compost we're missing all the carcasses <laughs> so yeah i think that's important too man just i mean as simple as faa you know what i mean the power of those amino acids you know what i mean um is, is very beneficial but yeah i definitely think that um you do get value to um to the animals in in your compost you know what i mean like you said nothing could be vegan i was talking that talking to my wife the other day and we we're walking through the woods you know i was like 
you can't have vegan out here because there's stuff dying. A deer could have died over there two months ago and now it's decomposed. Well, the soil has all that, you know, meat in it, you know, if you will. So, you know, it, it, to me, certain things cannot be achieved because they're not that way in nature. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, it doesn't really answer the question on the ratio, but, you know, I feel like it was important to add that in. I like it. And it's true and it's how it is. And so that's what I like looking back at all the time is what's nature doing. And I know you guys do too. I see that in all your shows. So um, I really appreciate that. And yeah, just a wacky, a wacky thought I've had that I'll probably never be able to prove, but yeah. Well, I, I guess think you have to test it. Yeah. I think there's something special too with the, with the blood. Like if you're really talking, you know, you're ranching on your own farm, things are dying, things are changing. There's something to the blood aspect to it. seems like the, the soil life loves when those kind of things happen. There's a, like almost a, a, a renaissance of that, that little area when things have passed on. So uh, I think that we, as in, especially a lot of us that are trying this as an indoor farmer, we need to kind of remember those things that actually what happens in nature and, you know, driving here this morning, Bart, I mean, it, it's comical to think that how else could Mother Nature do that unless there was some kind of microbial life? The leaves are literally falling as I'm driving, feeding for next year. It always seems like Mother Nature's, uh, you know, years ahead and in, in, in her thinking. You know, it just seems like the trees grow in a way. They're always matching if if it's undisturbed and living out here, man, it's <laughs> about as undisturbed as it can get. And you can see that the, the overall health of the, of the is, is drastically different than the trees that you would see in Denver. That's it. Yeah. There's an amazing um, magical intelligence I feel in nature. And it's why I've wanted to, to run my business the way I do, because I just always have felt I, I'll never really figure it out. But if I'm a good steward and I listen well enough, nature can teach me and I can kind of ride on the coattails, if you will, of all this magic. And so, yeah, just like making the, the Bokashi or the compost we make, it's always, I don't know how you feel, but every time I'm like, it did it again. There's 2 million pounds of something that just got made by trillions of billions of little worker robots that nature gave me for free that I can't even see without a microscope. So they're working all day, every day, every know. day, working That's so why, hard. Yeah. One thing I like to tell people about compost is, you know, time is your best friend. You know what I mean? Like if you start a pile and it isn't even if it's out of balance or if it's not right, it just time. You know what I mean? If you let it sit there a year, even two, um, it gets better and it balances itself out. Now, I don't know that if you go test that NPK, is going to be a balanced thing. I'm not sure how that works out because I don't do a lot of testing, but you you might know a little bit more about that. But I feel like that's where the microbiology from the earth and all the surrounding IMO, that's when it colonizes that um, compost and it just gets really, you know, gets really good. And I feel like it's important to collect IMO through every season and it's important to let your compost work and sit through every season. You know what I mean? I know that time is money and I get it. Every pound of compost is a dollar. Um, but what are your thoughts on like the value of kind of really letting that compost age or is it, or is that not necessary? You have a specific kind of formula, you hit it and now you're, you're kind of feel like you're good. I think it's critical. I think it's what, separates a good composter from a turn and burn composter and there are definitely some other elements but um the curing phase i i put as much if not more time into the curing of my compost than i do of the thermophilic phase and um i think that pays huge dividends if you were to go to a big front range um windrow composter like a1 or something um you know they'd think i was crazy i i spend a minimum usually of a year um total on a batch of compost and and more than six months of that is is just curing and so you know we'll we'll bring back in the biology from our cultured um piles but um as well the nature is a huge part of it and we have it's kind of why we maintain this it's almost like a permaculture food forest type situation around our compost areas you know, there's relatively undisturbed leaf litter in there. Um, 
and there are tons of wild animals. We have bears, elk, deer, um, fungal organisms. I harvest oyster mushrooms out of, out of those woods. And so by leaving like an undisturbed wooded area, which not everyone can do admittedly, but I have the luxury of that. We have 36 acres at our, our marsh facility. And, uh, and so we leave a big ring of that undisturbed, basically just to be a natural inoculation zone. And then, yeah, you like when the compost is running 150 degrees, that thermophilic phase, that's only seven to 11 organisms at the most. There's only 11 species of organisms that can do that hot phase. And so that's not species diversity. And that's really what we aim for. Like if, if my compost has less than 20,000 species in it, I, I'm going to stop and go figure out what I'm doing wrong. But no, oftentimes that's key right there. Damn, that's it. Okay. So look, yeah, I was so writing then, that shit down. Yeah. So, all right. So how does that, so their age in process now, all right, we went thermophilic. We know we're down to around seven. Boom. Now, how are you, what are you doing to build that up during that time period? And you don't have to be too specific, but take it as deep as you want to take it for the folks. Yeah. So, so which part? Just like after, okay, I went thermophilic. Now you, mm -hmm. you're hot. Now, now it's time to go ahead and age that pile. So how does that aging process work? And how do we go from that seven species that, you know, we're down to after thermo to getting back up to 20,000? And, and yeah, like exactly. Really so really mainly the, the two factors are one, the re-inoculation. So we use some spent uh, finished product compost and we keep plenty of it aside. And we do a few things with that. We like case in piles with, with it and that helps re-inoculate. But really we, we like to have um, a nice pile that we treat really well, keep uh, perfectly moist and really just, it's kind of like a sourdough starter almost. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that diversity comes out of there. Then too, by having those woods all around, um, those microbes just come on their own. And, and sometimes I'll go collect a little leaf litter out of the woods and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, if I go up to the, to the forests in, in our region, I'll always bring home a baggie or two of that material. And, you know, I don't need much. And if those microbes want to be here, they'll make it if if they don't they won't and exactly. uh, and so you know but the, i would say those are our two main methods of getting that cure started and and really accelerating like how much bang for the buck we get out of those six months um okay. because that's the thing in a, in a production operation if you run out of compost you can't just go get some more somewhere or something like that especially exactly. when when we've spent so many years perfecting our method. Um, so you just have to plan ahead and you have to, you know, you have to put um, a lot of money, you know, it's, it's uh, 80, sometimes $80,000 in chicken litter and, you know, it's 60 semi belt trailers. And then you've got, you know, a dozen uh, carbon trucks that are 120 yard walking floor trailers and mm -hmm. and you put this whole investment in and then your guys working it and mixing it and we should see some of that here this might be a good time to actually check out the video we made it shows kind of some of that that compost getting made we did a, a little uh, example run and so i would say that's something that really is where I see a lot of composters mess up their diversity mm. is in, um, in running windrow turners. And we have a windrow turner, but we only use it to mix our feed stocks. Um, and so there's some of our windrows you can see, and you can kind of see the woods around back. That's kind of the... Yeah, I'll just use there. a loader on those or a skid steer. Uh, well, we've got a few loaders. And right. so when we actually have to turn the pile, we turn it with the loader and fold it over because it's so much more gentle. On That's the, what uh, I like too, man. Gentle on that turn. I don't I don't like the wind row, man. I feel like it's just thrashing as I like run everything through a damn tornado, right? It's yeah, just, exactly. Uh, like um, the all at least all the fun, you know, the bacteria, they're fine. Like yeah. they'll bacteria will survive whatever you do. But uh the fungal organisms, they're, they're a whole different story. You know, we know spores are delicate. Mycelium's delicate. 
like mm-hmm. if you if you crush a mushroom in your hands it ain't going to grow anymore so um it's those fungal organisms that you've really got to watch out for you know and so this is this is Kyle just making a test strip and what he's doing here is he's mixing the chicken litter and the and that's one of the reasons we don't use like wastes i think it's great to compost waste but because we're trying to make a very consistent product we always use the exact same feedstocks and as we're as we're making our batches we even send lab tests off to make sure there's no variation from year to year with the the places we're getting our materials kyle's nice on that loader he's yeah he's man consistent. He's fresh. He's fresh. Yeah, yeah he's, he's spent a lot of hours in that thing. Oh yeah, and tell. your consistency is really what allows your brand to want to be seeked out by these huge organizations here in Colorado. Um, you know, especially if some of the I would say most commercial cannabis farmers have experience where, you know, maybe five of the big satchels are are legit and one of them is off. You know, and it just mm-hmm. seems like if you ordered a a truckload. Not all of them are, are exactly the same. And um, when you first, uh, <clears throat> you know, ordering soil, especially at a larger, you know, you might have ordered one sack. So you never re- really experienced that until you get burned. Um, so I kind of wanted to put that out there. If you're thinking about being a commercial cannabis farmer, you need to know your soil just like a playbook. You need to know everything that could potentially mm-hmm. go wrong. Uh, heavy metal problems. There's just so many aspects that could potentially too many variables uh, for you to kind of just use somebody's soil especially at on a grand scale uh and kind of naively think that all of that soil is the same it's really hard to achieve that there's even uh hardly any machines uh we were joking the mitchell ellis brand i mean there's just (laughs) there's not too many out there so you got to have the right equipment you got to have the right team to be able to do this consistently and uh, that's why i took the drive down here to speak with the bart today and kind of highlight everything that's going on because there's a difference um and all of the different uh, brands out there. There's got to be some trust in that, man. You know, because, you know, I build my own soils for that reason. You know, if you're going to have someone build your soil, that, that trust has to be there. And knowing that consistency is there. Just throwing rough numbers out at people. If, if you want to think about it like this, if you if you have a soil company and, and they're not as trustworthy, right? Just say they, they spend a thousand bucks to haul in a truckload of, you know, say sand. Well, just think that weight of that sand might be 10 tons. Well, if they're selling their product by the ton, it's easy to go in there and throw in 10 tons of sand because you're sell- buying it for a thousand, but you're selling it for five or 10. So you got to know, you got to trust these soil companies. You know what I mean? There's there's a lot of ways that people can get over on you. And um, I think that's one of the big things I like about Payonia because you guys, you see Bart, you hear him, you, you can listen to him. You know you're trustworthy and i think that um your quality and that people come back to you and that you know these big organizations the bot- botanical gardens and all those folks you know they're not using you because you know for for not, because you're not trustworthy so i think um hats off to you guys you know for being one of those companies that are you know really putting your effort into it and making sure that you get people stuff right and it's not just like oops sorry you know you know didn't want that to happen you know you can't sometimes you just can't have mistakes so um definitely hats off to you guys for um for that consistency yeah thank you barco i really appreciate that and it was what really inspired me to get into this business was um you know you as a grower you you do something one year with somebody's product and you think you got it and the next year it's totally different you got to spend the first few weeks of your season recovering from from these changes and so you know, it's not easy, but we put a ton of effort into trying to make the same product every time over and over again. And, uh, and, and nobody's going to get anything perfect, but, um, and certainly not us, but we, I feel like we try harder than a lot of people. And, uh, and you just kind of saw there in that, in the end of that, Joe, um, was putting newts in and that's something we do a little different. And maybe if Ken wants to pause it here, this is a good place to, uh, to uh, chat a little bit about that. But that was a great use of that windrow, man. I'd love to be able to use that when I'm blending big batches. That was, that's sweet. Yeah, thank you. That thing was amazing. That was actually the Southern Utes machine. If we had to buy that thing new these days, it's like $480,000 ridiculously. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got an old 12 valve Cummins, like all my other machines. And 
uh, it had so many leaks, but we went all through it and put all new O-rings and everything and brought an old machine back and uh, saved a lot of money. But I also would much rather run an old machine than a new machine. Um, so, and, and basically what, what we did there, Joe, you saw him putting some powders in and those are some limes and some humates. And um, we, even when we make our compost, we try to balance it a little bit ahead of time. We know it's going to be out from all brick ratios with the NPK, but because it's so high in potassium, we're going to boost the um, micronutrients there. And um, uh, we're going to uh, really use that biology then to have time to digest and bioconvert that lime. And by the time you get the compost, that's a whole nother calcium source that you wouldn't have if you put the lime in at the end. We also have other CalMag stuff that goes in when we make the batch, but I really feel like there's something to pre-digesting um, your, your calcium and magnesium within the composting process. Uh, and in, in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like KNF or something like that. It's a, it's a different way to extract a calcium and make it a usable form. Um, but using the aerobic uh, compost microbes. And, and my favorite method of composting is aerated static pile. Um, we've tried different methods over the years, but we really like blowers under the piles. Um, I think that's the, the right way to, uh, to save money. Like the windrow turner is cool. I love it for mixing the stuff like you saw. Um, but to run that thing three times a day through a pile, I just can't imagine the expenses so high labor, everything else when you can just run a fan, um, you know, and, and the city of Vancouver makes a million cubic yards of compost a year using their aerated static pile system. So, oh, all right. That's a great, con yeah, great, um, technique. So I've been looking at that as well. How, um, what kind of spacing do you use on your pipes? And is that important? And then how much kind of airflow is important to get through those pipes? It's, and what, it's you, and what really he's talking important. about, guys, if you if you build your static pile, meaning he's not turning it, but he's building it on some um, perforated type PVC piping, which then blows air up into it, which we know air is what's going to keep um, things from going, you know, anaerobic. Exactly. Yeah. And the research shows that uh, a pile will deplete its oxygen in eight hours. And so, um, you know, and, and it really, there's a lot of engineering depending on how big you want your piles to be, how tall, um, whether you're going to layer them straight next to each other. But a good rule of thumb is maybe, you know, a six inch pipe for a hundred foot run. And, uh, and there are whole patterns that matter. And then when you're making your compost substrate, you have to be really careful about um, like, uh, your bulking agent. So we use wood chips for that and then we screen them out later. Um, but that really gives you some airspace, some porosity in the pile to allow that, that air to get through. And then there's positive and negative pressure systems and pros and cons of each of those. Um, but it, it's a little bit of an art, but it's fun. And it, you know, it's so much less energy than this giant machine where you have to move thousands of tons of material every time you want to just get some air in it or are you just going to spin a blower and yeah. and that uses almost no energy and do that 15 minutes a day and so to me it's so much more elegant to move the air than move the compost yeah definitely and everybody knows if you ever pick up a shovel and try to move a pile of compost or soil it's back breaking you know if you don't have equipment i mean i have equipment and i don't even want to turn it sometimes because it's still the act of taking the time to turn but I think a simple, um, easy technique that I'm going to try is just like you said, a six inch pipe, small pile. I got, I'll probably be around eight or 10 yards. And then if you say the pile depletes itself in about eight hours and you could set a timer, just run an electric leaf blower every four to six hours or something like that. Probably. That's it. Yeah. Three times a day is pretty much the gold standard. If you don't have, um, computerized oxygen detection. So, you know, just do it 15 minutes, three times a day, you're golden. And, and I really think it's a great method for home systems. The leaf blower is a little noisy. I mean, it'll really power it in there and it works good, but 
there's blowers in all sorts of junk. Like um, I've helped people, old swamp coolers are really great. Um, old furnaces, uh, you know, you can, you can find surplus places online that have old blowers. Old um, inline fans. Inline oh. fans, any of that stuff makes a really great system. Um, so it's pretty easy to make a, a farm scale compost system out of a swamp cooler and a, uh, a bunch of PVC pipe and you're, you're off and running and a timer. Yeah. I bet that, I bet that end product is really kind of gives a nice fluff when you dig in there at the end of kind of one of those piles. I bet it really, um, cause you know, when you turn and turning, even being gentle, it still kind of packs you down each time. You know what I mean? It does. So taking that up, turning element out of it. I bet there's some real nice mycelium running through there. Nice long threads and everything. So that's it. I've cut into piles often and and just seen huge, huge mycelial networks running through the entire pile, and uh, and it freaks people out. Frankly, sometimes when they get one of our bags of soil, and uh, and they water it, and I tell everybody, you know, water your soil if you're going to keep it around a little bit, and and a bag of soil will often just produce a massive fruiting body um, harvest suddenly, you know, <laughs> and they're like, whoa, what just happened? Is it mold? Is it this? Is it that? And no, you just have to reassure them, you know, the, the pathogens grow on the plants. And this is why you'll have way less issues with fungal pathogens, mm -hmm. because you have this species diversity of other fungal um, organisms and they'll out compete. Like even if they don't actively destroy them, which some of them do, most of them don't, but at the very least they're going to use up the fungal food resources that those fungal organisms like. And, and it's kind of the nature of whores of vacuum thing. You know, it's going to put something in there and it's probably going to be the fusarium or botrytis you don't want. So fill it up with some mushrooms you do want is my attitude. Definitely. And that's your decomposition as well. You know, that fungi is breaking down those organic particles that are still in that soil. And that's also, you know, feeding the plants. So, True. yeah, embrace that fungi when you guys see those those good mushrooms in your soil. That's a good thing. Cheers. Yeah, people used to freak out about it, you know. Now yeah. it's, it's celebrated. So it's, it's kind of interesting once you're starting to understand things from like an A to Z process, you know, you don't destroy something that is magical. I mean, if you're getting fruiting bodies, just, you know, a few flips in, you know, pat yourself on a, on the back. You know, you're, you're really improving on Mother Nature. You're taking your big old brain, man. You're implying that kind of stuff. Um, and then it, you'll see literally the fruits of your labor start to improve. Um, and if you're not, then again, maybe go back and, and do some testing. I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with kind of admitting to yourself that, hey, I, I, I might not get this dialed in. Uh, until maybe a year or two. And if you kind of had that going into this, uh, it's not so frustrating when you do have issues or maybe, you know, you got nine out of 10 that are rocking in that one. You just can't figure it out. Uh, sometimes I've just started over. So, I mean, there's there's ways to do that. And then again, when you do build up these, um, you know, little <laughs> utopias, you'll realize how hard it is to keep up the consistency and the quality. And again, that's why I think Bart, you know, it's kind of silly to think that you would be able to do that. And if you're churning these post, um, compost piles with your own shovel, I mean, you know, you, you know, just from that aspect. So, uh, again, I, I caution individuals when they're going, getting into the big leagues of, of just running and buying soil that they've heard of before. Um, do your own research um, and then find out what's best for you. There's obviously so many different ones out there, but uh, behind the scenes, they're all not the same. Thanks, Brian. Definitely. Who, who do you use for um, biological testing? Who's a good uh, source for that? Oh, there are a ton of labs that do a good job. I mean, I feel like Earthford is kind of the the old, uh, standard. old school, you know, obviously with the Ingham connection and all that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I, I would say for me, mostly I, I do my work myself. Um, I love to just put the stuff in the scope, see what's in there. Um, I used Ingham's original guide for quantification of organisms to, to originally educate myself. And these days I feel like for me, you know, I'm not trying to figure out every species of bacteria in there, every species of mushroom. What I'm kind of trying to do is just look at overall populations and be like, okay, 
do we have a nice balance of, of bacterial and fungals? You know, and I feel like crews get all, oh, we're all bacterial this year. It's all, ba you know, fungal that year. And once again, for me, um, and, and I guess this was based on Dr. Kristen Nichols, it's these interactions between all these groups of microbes and the fungal and bacterial are the biggest. And, and it's interesting, people get all hyped for worms and worms are great. But really, when you look at, at the number of interactions, worms are super tiny compared to the number of interactions between fungal and bacterial organisms. And so um, that really um, sort of like drives a lot of my direction in, in trying to keep this large species diversity of the organisms that, that I feel most affect plant health. Um, so that's what I'm kind of looking at is just in the scope, what, what am I seeing in that way? And then of course the plants are the, the true test. That's, that's the real lab is, is doing growth tests and just keeping them going. And so, you know, my garden's here at my house every year. Um, uh, and then our farmers working with our farmers, they really give us that, that real time feedback. And in the, in the rare chance that we have something going on or something, we, we rely on, on our network to tell us, Hey, what happened here? Um, it's been many years since we had something like that happen, but a good buddy, um, it was, it was with cookies. We were, we were running our boron higher back in those days. And some of these, um, these indoor strains like cookies that were bred in a salt chem system with no boron were very, very sensitive to boron. And so we we're up closer to maybe, you know, four or five parts per million boron, which with a lot of veggies really made them more pest resistant. But then you throw some cookies in there and er, it just die. Um, and we really figured out that it was very sensitive to, uh, to boron. And we, now run at about two parts per million boron and everything these days, just for those super sensitive strains to, uh, to not have issues. I got you. What are your views on copper with that as well? It seems like that's kind of yeah, those are the hidden kind of elements. We don't really think about at first trace, trace, trace nutrients. Obviously. Yeah. Um, they, they're, they're extremely important. It's the whole base of the plants um, health and, uh, to me, you know, they're, they're so tiny, it's easy to ignore them, but I really feel like it's what Albrecht got right was identifying that all of these mineral elements are important. And so, yeah, I like running my copper about five PPMs. Um, and, and it's critical, um, and zinc manganese, um, you know, th oh, yeah. th those are the only places where we use sulfates. Um, it's really almost impossible to find zinc and manganese in a, a completely um, wild setting. So, so that's the place where a couple, a tiny bit of a couple of, of vitamin grade sulfates, I feel like help us out. But unlike a lot of these guys that are preaching single nutrient sulfates these days, I really think you can take a lot of, of all of these other more organic natural ingredients. And if you combine them skillfully, yeah, it's an art, it's tricky. Um, you have to look at all the ingredients independently and we have 22 ingredients in the bomb, um, which a lot of soil companies think we're insane for that. But every one of those ingredients is something that I've been able to, in my growth trials, show an actual um, noticeable improvement in either yield, plant health, something of that nature. And so that's where the whole kind of, kind of, uh, a product like the bomb comes from really is just trying to have all of those elements. Like in my N, P and K, I've got at least two, two different sources of every macronutrient, same thing through all my micronutrients. I've got multiple sources of all my micronutrients, um, you know, calciums in a few different ways, uh, even gypsum, which Elaine Ingham will tell you, no, no, don't do gypsum. It's a salt of calcium. It is, but I use a really judicious tiny amount and that really gives you this calcium shot right from the get-go so that you don't have to, like if you're, if something's off with your biology or, or any way around it right off the bat, your plant is pumped up to it, to it where it, it needs to be on calcium. And then you can use all these longer, um, 
longer digesting calciums to carry the long haul through for you. But uh, I really like a, a little touch of gypsum there in the get-go. I think that gets you off and running if it's used judiciously. Yeah, I agree, man. G gypsum's a really good, uh, really great input to, you know, to use to build my soils. Um, so you talked about larger scale um, diversity, larger soil member diversity. Do you have any of that in your bags? Will you see worms? Will you see anything like isopods in there? Or is that your kind of process, the way it works? You don't really have time or those things don't emerge during that, you know, while they're still in the bag kind of thing? Yeah, um, we, we've occasionally seen worms in our bags, but I don't add them. We do have a ton of microarthropods, um, and uh, we actually inoculate two main species into all of our compost piles. Um, we use Stratiolilapsimitus mites, and we use uh, Steinernema feltiae nematodes. And at other times, we use a couple of other beneficial nematodes, but always we have those two in our pile in really high quantities um, and our entire, all of our properties pumped up with them. Um, Are those ones you found that will just stay in your, on your property and kind of live on, without adding more? Yeah, we get some numbers of those um, just always recurring in our environment, but then also we're, we're pumping it in that dynamic dressing compost. Um, both of those species will attack fungus gnats and thrips. And I feel like those are the most common um, soil-based pests in Colorado. They're just kind of ubiquitous in the environment. And so, you know, you could try and build an indoor composting operation and put stickies on everybody's feet and put them in a space suit. And you're still going to get some of that coming in through some crack or another. And so we just go the other way. We just pump the the predators of those and so in that way you know are you never going to get a fungus snap with our product no but it's going to be like one if you ever see one come out of our bag or something it's not going to be one of those situations where you cut open a bag of california potting soil and a cloud of fungus gnats flies out right um, I, you know i actually had that written down i wanted to ask you so that a lot of brands call that forest duff and I guess behind the scenes, from what I understand, and correct me if this is wrong, what that means is that they're mixing, they're stepping on it, Marco. They're going out of there and adding the filler and Mother Nature. So they have really no idea what they're adding into that uh, when they're using forest stuff. Is there any of that true? There's a ton of that. And it's one of the things that um, were really, uh, one kind of beat us up last year in COVID or maybe even this spring in COVID that when the prices of the premium ingredients went up, um, pretty much almost everyone else in the business uses uncomposted bark. And so that was still almost free, you know, or very cheap. And so they just upped the ratios of their uncomposted bark and didn't change anything else about their mix. And we, you know, said, no, we're going to hold the course. I mean, yeah, a container of cocoa is really expensive, but my customers depend on this consistency and I'm not going to suddenly start dumping some uncomposted bark in there. I use plenty of wood, but my wood is always processed by the composting process over, you know, that pretty much a year's time. Um, and so, um, yeah. So the fungus nets, those like some of those brands where it's like almost comically known, like, Hey, if you're using this, you got to, kind of set it up for fungus gnats. They're going to be yep. in there. Most of that's coming because they're using some kind of filler and they're just not going to be able to obviously kill off everything. That's it. And and they're not setting their biology up to kill off everything either. You know, we the they're getting everything from the forest and then they're getting everything from the fields. And, you know, in, a, in an afternoon in Colorado and the, as the sun's setting, you'll just see thousands of fungus gnats everywhere just sort of lazily floating through the air it's what makes a nice summer day nice but <laughs> not if they're they're coming for your stuff and so you know that's why i love making our compost and hence our soil um biologically active in that way we we tilt the scale towards it being a place fungus gnats come to die 
And yeah, you way. give us you give us you give the grower a, a product that they can work with without having to start a fight right out the gate. You know what I mean? No one wants to have to start battling right out the gate using using the product. So that's um, it. So definitely skills, building in it, building that IPM in is dope. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you, you the worms. I just wanted to say you dropped gold bars for people that are thinking of getting into the predatory uh, mites and those kind of things because mm -hmm. there's there's a variety of them out there. Um, and I was actually uh, t talking to Michigan Bed officials yesterday about this, how some of those big box brands, you say you get a thousand rove beetles, man, you're lucky if 500 are showing up alive. Yeah. Um, and, and unless you're a big a big time uh, account. Most people don't, you know, it just feels off. So that's why I like uh, supporting the the family owned businesses because uh, there's just something different about that, man. And when you're taking, uh, you know, you're putting your kind of like name in a, in a way behind your brand name. Uh, so it's, yeah, yes, it's Payonia Soil, but it's Bart Eller's company. And that's what I like about him, man, is that he's, you know, you can pick up the phone and he answers. You know, that that's pretty rare nowadays with the, with some of the larger commercial things um, all over uh, the industry. Well, thanks, man. Good reputation. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. So I was going to ask you though. Um, so I have, let's see, I got a soil that I haven't turned. You know, compost slash soil about eight yards sitting on my property. I haven't turned it. Let just natural grass is just covered all, all over it. My um, next step, I'm going to peel the grass off, throw that in a big JLF to do its thing. But what do you think um, are what do you think are benefits or negatives to kind of being overly, you know, uh, hands off after you have a compost or, or pile built? Can you be too hands off? Well, if it's going in a direction you don't want, if it's going anaerobic, that'll be bad. Um, if it's, but it's already complete, you know, nice and yeah. Rare. So no, in general, it'll probably be pretty, pretty chill for you. And I, I like a cover crop. I'd like maybe a nice clover over it or something like that, just to help okay. keep the biology alive. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it'll sit there and and you'll you can watch some of the profile of some of the organisms' diversity change over time. Um, something like that, especially if it's just baking out in the sun under the dry heat with, you know, or if the water drops too low, something like mm -hmm. that. But in general, it it protects itself and does pretty amazingly well. And if you can make sure, like I like a, a smaller blower that's sort of a maintenance blower on the finished compost. Um, you don't have to put nearly as much energy into it, but at least getting some air in there will keep it from going anaerobic over a long time. Almost but, like just a breeze, a gentle breeze versus the kind of the the wind. hurricane, the big blurs are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, that's exactly it. But uh, yeah, we have more of that video if we want to check out some more of it. And this this kind of launches us into. So here we've come back to our to our uh, mix yard where I started the the whole thing. And uh, and you're on the ground, right? No slabs, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, we we still work outdoors. We have several acres. We'd like to do a big building someday and move it all inside, but it's going to be a heck of a building when we do it. Would you um, recommend just a slab though outdoors, or if you're going to do, do the slab, go ahead and go indoors with it? We've we've looked into it, and really, we just can't see the advantage, and it it separates your compost from the earth and. Correct. I feel like I get more of the species diversity I want not being on the slab. And then you've got the interaction between the concrete itself and the compost material. Um, there, there are a few things that I really don't like about composting on a slab. It would have some advantages too. So, um, you know, that's certainly, that's certainly a part of the whole, the whole game, probably in our future, it will come someday, but, um, for now, I'm pretty dandy, delighted working outside as far as how water works, respiration. Colorado has an amazing env environment that's just perfect for composting outdoors. So this is a cool machine here. It looks like Jaws. What you what you all, what y'all got going? Thanks. Yeah, that's that Mitchell Air Ellis Core Buster, and uh, so we bring in our core from India. It's super low EC. Um, when they when they use coconuts to make products over there the core is what's left over it's the husk of the coconut 
And if it wasn't used, it would all be burned in a, a incinerator to get rid of it. So you can put it on a ship and then put it on a truck and send it here. And you're still conserving two thirds of the amount of carbon that would have gone into the atmosphere. Nice. So it's a waste product and a, a carbon negative waste product. And I, I really like it, especially when the prices are good. Here's some perlite. Come, so you saw the core coming in and getting. Hold chopped. on, you guys built a, your own little rail line, man. We got yeah, that. we we do a lot of stuff on that. I like that. What y'all use? Just some uh, aluminum I beams, or is that no, a, no? A um, actually, it's it's wood timbers that we had custom milled at the sawmill here in town. It was standing dead wood, and then the frame of of it all. There's actually like some trestle in there, and that's all made out of old pallet rack that we welded um and uh and then those rails are very specific special rails do they made. have wheels on them yeah they've they got wheels, wheels for pallet handling cool um, and we've got the special kinds that we like uh but anyway that line can take a full semi of any of these input materials so when the semi fills up and you can see we keep about 10 semis uh that's that's a perlite stash right there mm. um and is that a drone shot right there? No, that's our oh. crane shot. That's okay. out of the. You like that? I was like, wow, we got a, a lot we of got good a camera work going on here. Yeah, not bad, huh? We, not bad at all. We tried. We made this video yesterday. So. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So um, you you that, like the paralite? Um, you just... know, um, and and here's our clover cover crop before we oh, we do the perlite game. What I like about perlite is perlite's amazingly consistent. It mm -hmm. gives you great drainage and aeration. Um, it's negatives, I would say, like over time, it's going to break down a little bit. Uh, depending on your growing style, it can float to the top. But in when I grow in like big, I love growing in like a 200 gallon pot mm -hmm. and the food web binds it all together and it just all is one big mass. Um, but I, I don't feel like it has the, some people really say that it harms worms and things like that. And I haven't found that to be the case. Um, but we do all of our mixes in um, a rice hole variant where we'll swap the perlite for organic non-GMO brown rice holes. Um, so like the raised bed mix is that version of the bomb. And, uh, and our longevity product is made with rice holes. And so we use rice holes a lot, but I still have a ton of people that love perlite. And I don't hate on it as much as some people do. Um, and and feel like it really is an amazing amazing drainage generation agent so now you like it more than just pumice i felt like that's more people are using the pumice so we've used pumice over the years pumice scoria done all these mixes tests and the big thing i don't like about the pumice and the scoria is depending on the mine you get this high variability of the mineral content and mm -hmm. when you're working as hard as we are to try and get your mineral ratios exactly right because to me, that's what unlocks the next level of growth and especially in high feeding plants. And it's how we can get these results that other people don't is by having the minerals exactly in the right ratios. And then if your pumice all of a sudden, you know, they're in a different seam and now it's got a ton of this element in it or that element in it, it can really knock your minerals out of whack quick. And you won't even know it if you're not like testing every single batch. So it's what I like about pumice is its consistency. It's and then the inertness of the uh, of the perlite is what. Indeed, it's like. minerally inert and it's very consistent. And um, you know, the, I, I don't like that that they need to run it through a furnace. It's it's heat expanded volcanic obsidian is what what perlite's made from. Um, and so you know, I would love to find an alternative and we will probably do more investigating of mines again to see if we can find uh, a consistent source of pumice on the scale that we need. But in the meantime, the rice holes really kind of filled that niche for us. And, you know, the silica and the rice holes give you a, a lot of aeration and drainage as well. Um, and then over time uh, it breaks down, but it really holds a lot, a lot more water. So, that's all of our rice hole mixes are kind of our like high moisture holding low water type mixes. Yeah. I love the rice holes. They're good aeration. 
Work. I'd like to see some of your stuff on the East Coast, man. Is that possible to get some of your stuff out here yet, or are you guys? Yeah, thanks. Certainly, in the full truckloads, we send semis out there. Okay. Um, we we don't send like little bags of soil in the um, UPS just because it seems kind of like an environmental disaster. Mm. We really like shipping semis. It's seventy eight of our custom bulk bags on a semi. Um, and so anybody that's doing those kind of quantities, absolutely. We could have a semi there in three or four days, but, right. uh, we've, we've got some growers with some, some grow channels in Virginia right now. Three of them have been talking about starting stores in their, um, their respective regions of Virginia, uh, and, uh, uh maybe getting some stuff to the people that way. Um, we really like working with farms, with um, kind of independent growers that want an independent business. We don't sell any of our soil through big box stores or anything like that. Um, so we love like nurseries, garden centers, hydro stores that are independently owned. And we feel like they're positioned in their communities to support our soil um, and to give back to their community. And a lot of things are going by the wayside with web businesses and all that, but that's kind of the, the methodology we really like is this, you know, us as a wholesale manufacturer working with these stores who really care about their people in their community to support the product and, uh, and, and make a decent little bit of money off of it. So if you're a farmer in your area, you want to get a few farmers together, this can really add a lot of revenue to a, uh, to a small organic farm. And, and we move a lot of soil. So, um, you know, get three farms together, add the soil. If you got a forklift and a nice place to put it, you're off and running and, and you can help your community out. Hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, now we had briefly talked about like, uh, you know, when you're, when you're taking your game to the next level with the commercial side of things. Um, so, you know, just here recently, you're working with a farm uh, where they purchased a large amount of soil. Uh, and unfortunately, it, uh, it didn't live up to the standards that they thought they were purchasing, you know, and, that, and that's really, again, the I, I hear that honestly every time it, when there's truckloads, it's just never exactly right on everything. It's like, you you know, you're paying for the high end thing and you're getting a, a low end thing on some of them. So then you kind of as a group have to figure that out. So I wanted to, and Marco, we talked about this before the show. I really wanted to, to pick Bart's brain on this because here in Colorado, this is a huge operation. We're not going to talk about you know who they are, uh, but I want you guys to know behind the scenes that this is a major operation. So you have a, a bunch of bright-minded individuals at this operation that have collectively come together to pick this man's brain. So I wanted to understand, Bart, how you were able to kind of like walk in um, you know, sometimes the head grower feels a certain way as soon as you walk in because you're, kind of, you know, in reality, you're there because something's not right. Um, so I know that you're really good with your people skills. And I, and I wanted to highlight that as part of this, as well as um, what you figured out and ways that you were able to turn around their THC and terpene content. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, it It is really interesting to see the trials that these folks go through. And some of these outfits um, are million or multi-million dollar operations. Um, you know, this place has over $20 million in Nexus greenhouses. Um, but the thing I keep seeing in a lot of grows in Colorado is uh, heavy metals issues. And, um, you know, it's, it's really sad when somebody spends uh, potentially a million dollars in a soil and then fails. Uh, and it can it can put one of these organizations and all their employees right on the edge, and so um, you know a, a little bit through luck, but also through um, design. E even when the heavy metals regs came in, and it's it's impossible to to not have any heavy metals, but um, the new regs in Colorado were admittedly over. I feel overly strict on heavy metals. Um, Nonetheless, uh, from the from the very first day the regs came in, all of our soils were fully able to produce um, cannabis as a living soil that met all of the Colorado State heavy metals regulations. And and to kind of put this in perspective, like the EPA regs for compost on arsenic 
are um, 64 parts per million. And we're, we usually sit at around 0.6 PPMs. So um, basically about a half of a part per million. And uh, uh, the, the amount allowed in flour is 0.3 PPMs. Um, so like just a third of a part per million. So, um, you know, people got really confused about this. They'd send soil to a flower test lab and the flower test lab would send back a result that say it failed. And so you have to understand, you know, uptake of the heavy metals by the plant, um, the, the type of ratio, but yeah, it's one thing we've been able to do is help, help our customers look at their heavy metals, um, uh, really like sources. And the only time we've ever had a customer have an issue, we've been able to track it down to, you know, metal stakes from China that they're putting in their soil or um, a certain type of plastic pot that's really high in a certain heavy metal. And so, you know, we had a couple of those in the beginning, but by and large, 98% of our customers were passing right off the get go. And there are a lot of other soils companies in Colorado that weren't. And, uh, and some of them even came out with like clean mixes and things like this to try to try to get ahead of those issues that they were having with their mix. But, um, you know, to me, like all of your mixes should, if you can, should be able to pass with the lowest yeah. heavy metals. And it's been important to us. And I'd say, you know, one ingredient that really the, the only one we ever had a problem with was kelp. And we used to use this uh, northern Atlantic kelp. And we really had to get away with away from it and go to the inland Icelandic kelp just because of the naturally occurring amount of um, some of these heavy metals in the ocean. You just really can't use an ocean product. Uh, and I, I assume it's maybe always been that way, but also certainly in modern times with pollution, I feel like there's a little more of an element of that. And so it's kind of sad, but yeah, we have to, we have to stay away from the ocean products to really have this very clean um, type product that, that we put out. And so, you know, I do feel blessed that, that we didn't have to fight that as hard as some people did, but also we put a lot of work into trying to make it that way. So yeah, I think you do a lot of advanced. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I think you're being a little modest here. I want to, I want again, highlight that you, you, so there's, it's not like there's four people at this operation, you know, you're, you're probably talking a hundred plus, um, and they were on the brink of, you know, not being able to to obviously support that. So uh, I want our audience to realize that today's guests and all of our guests are, are bright minded individuals in the uh, in the cannabis space. And there's obviously a, a lot of different chefs in the industry. Uh, but sometimes, you know, behind the scenes, not everybody is doing the stuff the, the way that you think. Um, so that's, again, why. You know, it's, it's up to you, especially the, the larger commercial farmers to do your research, because once you get burned, it's really hard to recover from that. Or like, you know, here's a company that's been around a long time, uh, to be honest. Uh, they have everything they think they're running. They maybe want to try to improve things. That's why everybody's so hesitant on ever, you know, changing the lane is because once it's up and running, they don't want anything to fail. And that's one of the biggest issues with living soil is sometimes they fail and they don't even understand why. And it might be because you didn't do your research and you're running with a soil system that's not as uh, consistent as you think. Um, and so then that's not even on you or your team. Uh, and the suits aren't going to want to hear that. Yeah. I assure you. That's it. That's for sure the case. And yeah, it's a it's an interesting game, and we've got a lot of really great um, growers and uh, and operations in Colorado that have used us for years. But it is interesting the new ones, and I I do feel proud of some of these bigger ones that are that have really used what we can help them with to stay living and organic, and um, and not go over to the salty chemical dark side. And it, it gets tempting. I, I really feel for them. Like when it's your bottom line and yeah, your hundred employees is about to, about to go, go on the street. Um, you need to look at some other alternatives, but I really want people to understand that it's not living soil. That's the problem. You can, you can grow living soil weed that passes all the, all the uh, specs and all the regs in all the States. And you don't have to just use a, a, soilless media or something like that um 
And I, I really feel like sometimes people, when they can't do it, they say, oh, well, you can't do it with living soil. Well, I just, I, I don't believe that. And we've proven that that's not the case. Yeah, but yeah definitely as, proven. As much um, as the heavy metal stuff there is is cool, I really feel like it, the mineralization is what we've done with that operation that I, in particular, that I feel proud of. Um, we're able to keep those beds, the, the same beds running year year after year after year continuously and just producing better and better quality. And, you know, it's, it's proven in the terpene profile for me is, is where the, where the proof is in the pudding. And so that's, that's a whole way of these large grows to save money. You know, does our soil cost a little more than some? Sure. But we're hoping you're going to run it for two, three, four or five years and, and be just amending uh, what you need over that time. And so we get a soils test each round and, uh, and send out a custom blend. And so anyone, whether it's, you know, whether you're farming hay or you're at one of these high dollar operations, send us your soils tests in the, in the fall and I will read them personally. And when we've got spare time on our three mixers, we'll make you a custom blend in the fall that you can put out in the spring and you can change your whole, whole world. And, and so that's similar to what we did at Botanic Gardens. We're doing it across many categories, but it, it really changes people's worlds and gets them and the biology headed in the right direction. Okay. I wanted to drop back a little bit. Um, so you said you t your soil comes in at 0.3 and flour can contain 0.3. Uh, Our soil been, comes in at 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6, and flour can, yeah. can be up to 0. 0.3 heavy yep. metals. So, do we know what That's the for arsenic? Uh, yeah. Oh, just okay. Arsenic. Do we know what the uptake is? So, if we know if the soil is 0. 0.6, what the plant will do, or is each plant gonna is every scenario gonna be different with the amount of uptake? There's definitely variability with the biology. We've been trying to run some trials. I would love to see more science on this. But my experience is basically um, that as long as you're less than half or not more than double um, what the what the limit is, then um, you're going to be OK. OK. Um, you know, and there's a little bit of buffer room in there. Uh, but you're you know, you're really cutting some tiny hairs down in that. And, and so it's the tricky thing when you're messing even with the boron or the arsenic, once you're, once you're down to a part per million parts, like if you've got one molecule um, of this and you, you have to have a million more <laughs> of everything else to get it to the dilution ratio that's allowed. And that's, that's tricky. You know, it, mm -hmm. it is not an easy task to make a consistent thing where you're shaving a part per million. Yeah, I got it. Also, there's a lot of, um, I just picked up this book here, um, Heavy Metal Toxicity and Remediation by Soil Microbes. So oh, there's yeah. lots of, yeah. um, it's pretty good reading too, man. And it's like uh, how you say you're building in your IPM because there's certain things that I can't, or can't. I won't say can't, but certain things I source from companies, say rice holes. Um, I'm going to be focusing more on those specific microbiology that remediate the heavy metals as far as trying to build them into my soil so that if any of these ingredients do contain heavy metals, then now those microbes are already working in my favor to break them down. You know what I mean? So I think that's yeah, kind of some next level thinking um, as far as using microbes, man, even on heavy metals. Indeed. Yeah, isopods uh plugging my own stuff but isopods will uh, also clean up uh heavy metals and, and just clean up everything so decomposers you know you, yeah. you just need the whole uh soil food web and uh once you start to achieve that i think uh bart's teaching you guys today that especially on a commercial level that you can really steer this uh, as long as you understand your base and once you know that you have it tested um then that's when you can kind of run with it and, and find success because a lot of the big commercial farmers, especially when, when they're first kind of getting started, they first come online. A lot of those guys, myself included, our little group, we felt like we were flying blind there uh, for a while. You know, once the deal is done, uh, the soil is sold to you. 
the uh, the salespeople of the some of those organizations aren't as ex as excited uh, to pick up the phone, you know, because the sale has been done. So it, you and you and you should know that. So you got to put that on you that you really need to understand this. Um, and, and I think hopefully today it gives you at least that red flag where uh, we can even show you guys in real time here in Colorado uh, that well no I mean this guy was is a veteran grower you know it's not like he just all of a sudden made a bunch of mistakes uh, just all of a sudden the recipe wasn't what what they thought it was um, and then once they started to figure that out uh, rightfully so you know there, it's there's animosity there you know there's 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 certain feelings that are brought up when that kind of money is spent uh, and it's not right on that on that kind of scale bart like when you do make those larger deals um what is in writing and are people putting those kind of things in contract language hey this is based on i'm paying you half a million dollars based on my first run at least at the minimum not failing you know xyz things that could be contributed to the soil um are you seeing anything like that or how does the industry usually work on no that? there's i mean it's it's crazy like uh, and, and I, I would expect that maybe someday and, and, you know, we would be willing to do that. Uh, but most of the industry is making something different as nearly as I can tell every, every week. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I, I don't like to say names, but there's a company out of California that's big and it's got colorful bags and they've been doing this. And, and I, when I started this, I thought, oh, they at least make the same thing. I think I can make something better. Mm -hmm. But I thought they were making the same thing. And then you go out and you start testing the bags. And out of one store, I had four bags that pretty much every everything minerally about that, each one of those bags was completely different. And that really shocked me. Um, I didn't realize like how much variability there is. So I would think it would be very hard for most companies on the market to mm -hmm. uh, to sign some sort of agreement like that. Um but more and more, I, I expect it because, yeah, you get kind of hung out to dry if you get the wrong stuff. And so, um, you know, it's it, in, a, in, in a way, it's why we if, if somebody ever says they've got a, a problem, I'll start getting some soils test done. I'll look into it and see what it is. We'll we'll come out there, help you out, say, hey, what's going on here? But uh, but it's rare. And and when it happens though, you need somebody to back you up. And, and I do think that's something maybe that we're a little different or unique about is that, that we want to back every one of our growers up. And if, if somebody can show me that it's not working right, then that's the most interesting thing I can see. I want to go see why that could be right. um, and, and maybe get ahead of it for another customer or something like that. Yeah. Very smart. And to me though, you know, with that operation you mentioned, is that something that, you know, kind of testing when like, hey, here's my first delivery. Let me send this out for testing myself, you know, as the grower or the owner operator. Um, is that something that could have been avoided early? Had that even been done, do you think? Or do you know enough about it? It could have been. But uh, I think I think what happened um, is that uh, these laws came into play and it was right around the time people were putting in new new facilities and things like that. And so, you know, nobody, nobody knew about it. And this was a couple of years ago and, and a lot of people hit a, hit a pretty hard brick wall when, mm. when some of their stuff didn't work the way they needed it to. And when you've done a big investment like that into, into this dream you have and into all your people, and then it <laughs> fails. Um, <coughs> yeah. It's a whole, you, you really just have to have to kind of, it would be nice if folks would would at least kind of stand behind it or try to help out or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, but there are ways to deal with it. You know, as you guys mentioned, there are a lot of ways to remediate heavy metals. And so, um, you know, that's been able to happen, too. So, uh, uh, yeah, let's get back. Uh, so just we I guess we took a little lane from the video, but I, I definitely want the audience to see that there's there's so many problems behind the scenes so you guys are you know if you're having issues when you're first getting into this we, everybody does so just remember that you're you know the fact that you're with us every single week you're improving a lot at a lot higher rate faster rate uh than your competition than your peers uh, and even if you're an underground individual you know i mean you have to not only have your product but your product has to be so much better than 
even the dispensaries that people are willing to even, you know, call you. So all of this time and effort that you're putting into, you know, you're, you're seeing also from behind the scenes that on a, on a commercial side of, uh, of cannabis, um, it can be done, of course. Uh, but there's very few people that are able to do it consistently time and time again. And that's why you hear the same names from our shows uh, on the commercial side of stuff with Living Soils, because there's really not that many yet that are doing it. And so that's why we're continuing to pumping out this education, because that's what we want to see. We definitely want to see the the guys that have these major operations uh, be able to talk to their investors and say, hey, we want to try this. Um, and again, that's why I think, you know, major operations are picking Bart's brain because it is possible. You just really have to understand what you're doing. Yeah, thanks. And uh, and it is nice to see that movement because this planet is not going to last much longer if we don't make some changes and uh, and just doing it the old way isn't working. All right, so you mentioned uh, we got some cover crop growing here. Yeah, this is some white clover. I really love white clover. I like it um, for keeping weeds suppressed and you know, just if we're going to have some bare dirt, we're going to have something nice growing there. And, you know, we'll put Californicus mites into our clover and then any stray russets or spider mites or something like that, they're falling into a trap. Um, and uh, and I feel like there's a lot to that. And then we're going to start up a batch here. Um, so depending on the peat base, you know, you're going to start with some sort of a peat base. This is the sphagnum we get. It's a really high grade sphagnum. It's sustainably harvested by the same family for over 30 years. Um, they don't just mine it. They use large vacuums to, to vacuum harvest it in New Brunswick. And it's a grade that typically only goes to Europe. So I was all cocoa in the beginning of the company. And then I found this really cool sphagnum. And now I kind of like a half and half blend of those peats as a base. Um, and then this is where the magic really happens. This is like um, all of the nutrients, the worm castings, the fossilized seabird guano, the kelp, the fish bone meal, um, citric acid, on and on, all the different things that we use in our mix. And it's, it's already been metered out to um, the precise ratio. And it's the reason we still use batch mixers. A lot of bigger operations run continuous mix line but you just don't get the consistency out of a continuous mix line that you get with the batch. And there may be ways to fix that in the future, but for now, for us, we've got three of the bigger batch mixers in the state, they're ribbon blenders. Um, and uh, this one, this one's named Mixtris. The other one is Sir Mix-a-Lot. Uh, How many yards? <laughs> uh, these can do 15 yards each. Uh, wow. We do different size batches, but, uh, and then Beatrice, our front end loader. Um, and this is the core pit that you saw earlier where the core was getting chopped. And uh, what are those the big concrete blocks? And you just lined them with uh, like a rubber kind of to keep them from scraping off the dust and whatnot. Yeah, they're they're they call them V blocks or gravel yeah, pit. Yeah. Use them. And then we've got a whole whole uh, frame up there. And I like using belting. That's actually old mine belting. We okay. buy that surplus and. Once again, it's just part of our ethic of like reusing, recycling, upcycling. If there's okay. anything old we can use, we're going to use it first um, rather than buy something crazy new and expensive. And it's really the only way we can make a soil like this at any sort of a reasonable price is um, is by kind of taking these extraordinary efforts to keep our prices low and our quality high. And so you'll find a lot of weird old machines around our place that have fancy Hitachi drives and, and high efficiency electric motors on them. And, uh, uh, but like the steel steel and really they made the steel better back in the day. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a little bit like an ancient spaceship around this place or something like that, but. I like that, man. That's, that's, that's what's, that's what you got. Well, again, it's the out, quality man. that's coming out of it. And yeah, the cocoa man with some of these soils, Marco, it's coarse to the touch. Like, you know, there's even brands, uh, you know, their finished product is a little coarse. Like if you're really putting in, uh, doing a bunch of clones or something, finish something else, your hands are just feel like cut up. Uh -huh. um, and I think a lot of that comes from just it being coarse, sometimes even cocoa, probably a variety of things. But there's one in particular, man, that I when I when I felt it, it had like a velvety uh, touch to it. And so how are you achieving that on a grand scale like that? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's about vendor selection, material selection, you know, and of course you don't want it super fine. You want the porosity in there, but um, but by kind of choosing these elements and then you would be surprised how much the minerals contribute to that velvety feeling too. Like in a batch of the bomb, there are hundreds of pounds of, you know, ground rock and um, all sorts of different minerals and organic matters and all of that, all of those 22 ingredients add up to something. And for us, I've, I've never felt a soil like ours. And I really do think it's, it's a little bit of all of those 22 different things kind of makes that whole whole end product a certain way but yeah thanks i'm i'm glad you like that feeling and these 500 know, pounders uh they're about 450 pound and actually coming back to your putting sand in thing we do everything by volume not weight okay because okay. our moisture is variability by the season like if it's the middle of the winter and somebody's going to get a 400 pound ice cube right? and uh, uh, the microbes don't need as much water, then we won't put as much water in. If it's the summertime and it's hot out and we know those, the, our little friends are going to be needing to drink on the truck on the way there, then we're going to be pumping the moisture up. So for us, it's about volume, not moisture. And we even kind of overfill all of our, all of our stuff too. So um you know i don't know if it works out that way but it's just the kind of person i am i'd rather like over over deliver on an under promise or something like that thank than, you we need more just like way. you everywhere yeah <laughs> well, thanks buddy. then they're not calling you if it is a little bit you know it's i think it's so much easier and less of a headache if you just give a little extra you, you got a bag of soil coming buddy you know what i mean it's not don't break out your scale this is a pay on your bag <laughs> coming your way that's it just for you <laughs> And it, it, you know, it means a lot to me. I realize like when a grower buys one of those bags for, you know, $400 or whatever they, they cost at the store, um, that, that means a lot to me that somebody took their hard earned money and they put me in charge of their dreams. And that's what I realize you're basically doing when you plant anything is you're, 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 you're planting a dream. And it, it means a lot. And so this section here is interesting because our bags, we're the only ones in the industry that reuse our tote bags. Uh, there's a $10 deposit and particular large commercial customers in general have, and that's Cartier. That's our uh, mascot. <laughs> oh, Frenchie. <laughs> that's right. And, uh, and so it, it's a huge thing when these totes come back and then we wash them and it's it's no small effort to wash all those bulk bags you just kind of saw what those guys went through there and that those those all came back from a big grow and you know somebody cut a third of them's top and now you can't use them again the ones that come back nice uh some of those will go out 10 times and that is so much less plastic um, yeah. So it's a really low waste stream way of selling soil. It's it would be so much cheaper and easier for us if we didn't have to do that. You know, if we just uh, uh, bought a bought a new one and threw it out, way cheaper. But we have this program. We really believe in it. And uh, and if you can send those totes back to us, we'll wash them, make sure they're nice and clean, and we'll turn them back around and send them right back to you. These are the guys I like right here. These are the guys that I say you're getting paid to work out. You know, that's I mean? it. You get paid and you get to work out. What, what, what's better than that? Fitness plan built in. Yeah, <laughs> we've got a really great team. Uh, Pecos, Kyle, Corey, Robbie, Joe, Joe. Um, ton of ton of great guys out here that uh, that uh, do a lot of hard work and put a lot into um, making sure that that what you get is great and grows great things. And then this is kind of the results of that. Um, these are some gardens my wife did. My wife and I, this, this one we, we pumped up this spring. Um, here are some other ones. It's October uh, and we're st we've still got hydrangeas blooming, good color. The stuff's a little beat up this time of year, but it's still going. And so to be growing hydrangeas this time of year in Colorado, I feel like is, uh, is no small feat. And, uh, and then here we'll kind of, and, and the lawn too, no nitrates in this lawn, high species diversity, clover, 
creeping Charlie, um, water tolerant fescues, um, and and here's some zinnias, and then I'll just kind of this quick goes through the tomato plants are still pumping tons of tomatoes, and I'm a lazy gardener, you know, I'm like the mechanic that doesn't deal with his garden or whatever. So we put this <laughs> stuff out, and we pretty much mostly set it and forget it. Um, we sprayed some soap for some squash bugs, but uh, you can see some uh, big spaghetti squash over there. Um, you know, and that was the thing because oh, of, when you reuse the bags here, I just, yeah, we, I, we use the bags here and then we put the bamboo on to, uh, to protect them from the sun. Yeah. And so that's a 200 gallon grow bag, basically, um, aerating on the side, the broccoli is still, still, uh, generating broccoli. Here's some carrots. Uh, we'll be pulling carrots out of that through past December. Um, same thing with the potatoes too. So this is kind of the company trial garden. But you can see those species diverse carrots there and, um, uh, you know, uh, probably about four different varieties of potatoes that we ran in this garden this year. But uh, everybody who works here, all those guys who make soil, um, all, all uh, are out in it. Our sales team too, you know, Kate, Emma, Riley, they all have worked on farms, have their own gardens. Um, we're all just into this. We love it. And that's why we do it. And yeah, we might not be the biggest web presence, but uh, we move a lot of semis to some pretty badass soil and we're proud of what we do. And um, yeah, hope people enjoy it too, basically. Mm -hmm. It feels like a family environment here. I mean, this is his, his homestead. And uh, his employees were right out, you know, when I first pulled up. So, I mean, this is when you're talking about a family owned business, uh, it definitely has that feel and uh, the uh, MacGyver aspect to it as well. You know, like all those tractors and everything, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all running. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the cool aspect of it is might not be the, the shiniest, but you from from you know working at Buffalo and stuff. I know, hey, he's got the Mitchell Ellis. I know that's the Rolls Royce of the the Coco Choir Buster. I mean. I, I researched that shit myself, you know, and, uh, you know, the quality of your cocoa, it can go hydrophobic. If, you, if your brand starts to buy from a different uh, vendor, I've personally seen that when we were mixing stuff. And, you know, the other we had a new owner that care less about quality. So the ingredients went down and we started having hy hydrophobic issues. And it's because of, you know, shitty cocoa. So there's a lot of ways to, to really fuck this stuff up, man. And cocoa could come in real that. salty too on you. Like I've exactly. had that before yeah. where the owner ordered some cocoa from some source and shit was salty as hell. Plants looked like, you know, went to shit. And then we did a, you know, tested the leachate and the freaking PPM was off the chain, just out of the cocoa. So you gotta That's be a, definitely careful about that. So yeah, every one of our, every one of our containers of core that comes in, we tested ourselves and and um we have a spec ours is 0.3 uh ec is our our max that we'll accept and otherwise we make them take it back nice. and there you guys are you're going around educating a lot in colorado that's something else that i like you know you guys are going out of your way to continue to educate from just kind of smaller farms all the way to like I mean, Cherry Creek Mall is kind of the mall in Denver, Colorado. So, I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're in all aspects of it. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. And yeah, it's a, it's a pretty fancy place. We've got some big fancy customers. We've got a lot of little customers that, uh, that are really important to us too. Flower farms, you can kind of see there on the instant, that's little hollow flowers. Um, we've, we've got a whole lot of flower farms these days. And so that's our cut flower mix in custom four foot smart pot raised beds. And they were able to like quadruple their yields. They got longer stem length, better pigmentation. Um, the living soil can, can deliver whatever you're looking for pretty much in whatever industry. And that's what I love about it. And it's one of the things some people sort of get ooh about is that like the bomb or high feeder mix is designed for both like high feeding veggie annuals um, and it's kind of at the high end of nutrient balance for those but then also for cannabis and it's um, three weeks with no feed in cannabis is the system that we like to use and then start in with like a liquid amino or top dress with some uh, some feather meal for for uh, the rest of veg 
And then in flowering, we like doing um, uh, our dynamic dressing compost, which is like a one, two, three. And, and a lot of people are like, what compost is a flowering newt? But really, you know, you've got that high phos, high potassium, you've got calcium, magnesium, you've got trace minerals, you've got micronutrients, and you've got the biology. And, uh, and then you just kind of tune uh, the phos after that, depending on your strain. And so we use fossilized seabird guano. It's a zero, 10, zero. And, um, and then if you're, if you are doing KNF stuff, uh, that works really well in that same same kind of world you know you might not have to do as much but for the people who need a really simple system it's just run the bomb do your nitrogen tune it to your strain and veg and then run the dynamic dressing and the fossilized in flower and you can adjust your foss to your foss hungry strain um like a like an expert and it's it's so simple it's just really that simple and other than that do that maybe twice once right before flowering one at the end and water and that's it and and you can have amazing results out of that system um so yeah nice yeah it doesn't have to be difficult we i say it all the time jlfs are key you know get you a great soil man and then you make some jlfs one for veg one for flower and shit, you can just take it all away, grow some really quality uh, product and food. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's it. And I, I really do love the ferments. You know, there, uh, there's a whole world of that. A buddy here started making a nettles horsetail ferment maybe 12 years ago. That was my introduction to the whole thing and, mm -hmm. and seeing the results he got out of that, even as a silica um, kind of yeah, foliar spray. Tail yeah it was it was crazy it made those plants like bug proof they would try to bite a bite a plant and the silica in a foliar just you know made the plant basically uh impervious to bugs yeah definitely so you're so you're kind of like a family outfit so your your employees then understand hey don't run my equipment hard this equipment has to get us paid. This is, you know, if we fix less equipment, we get more Christmas bonus. Is that, do you guys got that kind of relationship where, you know, they get it, the whole kind of business aspect and what it takes? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, I'm blessed to have guys that really do care. And, um, you know, like my backhoe that I started this company with, that was, that was my half of my grandfather's inheritance. And I had it from my other place. And, I was a crazy guy that thought oh, I'm going to start this soil company because um, all my buddies had organic farms and we're living out here and nobody can get consistent stuff. But yeah, that, that machine is, has been working for me for over 20 years. And, uh, and, and these guys know that that stuff's important and, and that you might think running the old machines that, uh, that somehow they're less reliable, but really in a way these machines are designed to last forever. And so we do, we kind of, have a relationship with the machines we treat them well and uh and have a great maintenance program every monday here um, is a maintenance day and the guys are going through all the machines and making sure they're greased well and and that everything's top notch to start another week and and in doing that and kind of putting that attention towards the machines they they work for us year after year and yeah you got to fix them you got to mm -hmm. fix this and that but it's amazing to me the the life that these machines can give and and our guys are the the first line as the operators of these machines of of yeah. who who cares for them and who keeps them keeps them running well so i can't say enough about both our team and and the work they do yeah and, and also just to give the audience a little bit more deeper on the equipment like you, you're running these big tractors and stuff if you have a hydraulic hose burst depending on where it might ruin a whole batch. Like, so you gotta have, you gotta be kind of watching your stuff and being on point with everything you're doing out there. So um, yeah, it's important, you know, you can lose a lot of money easily uh, with some raggedy uh, equipment. <laughs> For sure. And there's For a difference sure. between old and raggedy, you know, raggedy is what we don't want, old and quality and reliable is what we do want so, and paid for. Here's to that. And you're saying you use like the Hitachi motors and stuff. You, it seems like you just kind of really know what's going to last instead of, you know, it's crazy. We crazy. can, we can kill things out here. If, if it's not 
top quality, we will destroy it in a heartbeat. I mean, we bought we bought these uh, Bates military boots two years ago. They didn't make it six months. We bought Danner, the whole team Danner, $300 Danner boots. They didn't make it a year. They were under warranty. They gave us all our money back. Like we're hard. We, we work hard and we're hard on machines and equipment. If it's not engineered for kind of the long haul, then yeah, we will destroy it. And so that has taught me over the years, like um, there are brands I've come to rely on and come to say, yeah, this, this will keep working. And those Hitachi drives, I've never blown one up. They're, they're super badass. Um, Whose boots are y'all rocking then since he went kind of <laughs> ran everybody through it? Uh, they're they're running uh, Ariat right now. They're trying the trying the three hundred and forty dollar Ariat super duper steel. Right work. I like tail. I like Red Wings. Red Wings are. That's what I was gonna say. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. what I see a lot of people use. We, I, we, I, that's heavy construction. I was three hundred pounds running walking job sites, and Red Wings would definitely hold up to it. There you go. We had Red Wings a few years ago, and we've been trying to trying to find some fanciers, but maybe we just need to go back to the Red Wings. We'll, we'll give them around next. <laughs> yeah, That's crazy, man. You never know what we talk about on this show. We talk about a little bit of everything. <laughs> that's how it boy. goes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, we, you, if your employees are, you know, Have they don't do. have the right equipment, man. They're not going to be getting the job done. That's yeah, I think, I think uh, putting time and effort into your employees pays huge dividends. Uh, especially not having to retrain someone, you know, and that was something that I'm I, you seeing that a, a lot of the cannabis spaces in, in Colorado, man, is you walk into a dispensary, you walk into a grow, very rarely are the same under faces, you know, you might see the same top individuals. Um, so you can tell like, you know, they must be every other month training a new team how to grow. Uh, and as a head, uh, as a head grower, that's got to be a nightmare. I mean, it's like teaching a playbook every month. Uh, to a new team uh, you guys aren't going to ever really start to gel uh, because now we got a whole new offense now we got a whole new thing to think about um, so from what i understand you've been doing this early 2000s Bart. Yeah, yeah well i've been making my own soils and growing organically really since uh probably about the early 90s like 92 93 Jeez. i was doing some aeroponics back then actually you know and and it I was just on the scene and I was like, Ooh, that's cool. And I've got my nutrients that NASA uses and all that. And then a buddy, uh, a buddy turned me on to the permaculture Bible. I was over in mobile, uh, Moab. And he, he had, I don't know if y'all know that original, the kind of $300 big thick permaculture book from Australia, Mm -mm. but seeing that changed my whole world. You know, it, it really showed me, oh, maybe there's a different way to do this. And it started informing how I how I worked with the soil. And then when we moved here in uh, 95, uh, that's when I started using some of the local chicken litter and making compost out of that and seeing the results. My wife and my wedding, we grew all the veggies um, in this in this what most people would think is pretty lousy soil out here with mostly a chicken litter as our entire fertility program. And um, that really informed and educated me. And so I've been making living soil for, for yeah, pretty much 30 years or something. And uh, in a, in one way or the other and doing it for a living since uh, 2012. So this is our 10 year anniversary as a, as an official company. Um, that's awesome man most people don't make it two three years oh thanks buddy yeah it's a high high i guess that's why a lot of people are afraid to do it uh but when you do things right man you're obviously taking care of your employees uh 10 years is uh you know something that's solid as hell you're you're in it to win it now yeah thanks it's it's been really rewarding it's hard it's definitely blood sweat and tears and um, people don't realize that. And, and that's why when somebody asks me, are you worried about a competitor, this, that, or the other, like, this is probably the hardest thing I've ever done. And I came at it with a lot of resources to do it. Um, but it is so rewarding and, uh, and it just, I don't know, it's a, it's a great thing. We don't get rich doing it. That's for sure. Um, but we feel good about what we're doing and knowing that millions of dollars of, of people's faith is in us every year, uh, 
uh, particularly in this region and then the other states that we've moved into over the past few years that that means a, a lot to us and it's a relationship between us the store and the consumer and the end of the product and each person in that relationship is just as important and uh and if it's not good for anybody in there then it's not good for the rest of us so we we really believe in that philosophy that we're in it together and uh and in the end it, it makes us proud to make some really badass soil and it makes us proud to see what you guys grow in it and it's usually something amazing how many um yards are you guys producing out there year is that something i mean give thousands a uh you know it varies but we'll probably do uh you know ten thousand plus yards this year nice. um i haven't looked at the numbers real recently uh, when we did compost, we made 2 million pounds of compost last year. And that's kind of a cool thing because, you know, at a 19 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, that means we're putting away um, uh, 1.9 million pounds of carbon. And uh, that would have gone into wood uh, fuel pellets otherwise. And so, um, you know, that's a really like... Uh, quantifiable amount of carbon put away and then you know the company does burn carbon so i've tried to quantify that as well and it seems like we're well under probably half a million pounds so you know we're pretty much 1.5 million pounds net negative uh worst case scenario and uh and i feel proud about that and then with our upcycled machines and our tote recycling plan um, I feel like we're a pretty sustainable business that's trying to head this thing in the right direction for everyone. And then the carbon that our growers sequester by putting it into this product, like those roots are going to do something. And, um, you know, it might be five years, it might be 10 years, but every time somebody grows something in our soil and doesn't just throw it away or burn it or something like that, um that sequesters that and it helps helps make this whole planet better potentially for all of our kids mm -hmm. keeps it locked away for a long time you know what i mean keeps that carbon bound up that's good man nice what are your yeah. biggest uh challenges you know from a business standpoint like where just name a couple things that like man this is always a worry is it is it getting your ingredients has that been a chore with the way things are because i know even in my industry it's been shipping's been a challenge and it's gone up a lot absolutely you know materials costs are crazy and um we put a lot of work last year into uh, having all of our materials pre-purchased and even here on one of our properties through the winter so that we would have enough to deliver for our customers. Yeah, COVID messed up supply chains. A cost of a shipping container from India went from $3,000 to $20,000 for a while. So um, that was super challenging. And every year it's something different. You never know what it's going to be. It could be the weather. It could be this it could be a materials sourcing supply chain problem it could be um rains in canada it could be uh, a trucking strike dock worker strike um this mine shuts down or that fire someplace and so it's it's hard like there's no two ways about that what we do is is tough and it takes our entire team and we we do more than you would think for for being our um little team here we we pull off a lot but it it takes a lot of thought and um you know business small business is tough and um we're going against the miracle grows of the world and they're making billions of dollars and they don't even know what's what's in their mix so <laughs> exactly. um pretty much we have to be better on every front we have to we have to be cost competitive we have to make a superior product we have to be local. We have to be organic. Um, you, you, you pretty much have to do everything right. And then maybe somebody will be like, okay, we'll give you a pallet space in our store. Or we'll, we'll give you a try. But I don't know. I just, I think that's kind of the fun of the game is, mm -hmm. is can we do this? Can we be some little guys that started in our backyard and now are on 36 acres and there's no pressure there. You you just grew into what you are, right? I mean, it's like this is what we're doing. 
This is what we're doing. I mean, there was definitely plenty of pressure, but um, <laughs> we, try, we, we try not to let that dictate okay. what we do. I got you. And then, um, so you guys run in winter too? Like, cause I know it's brutal there. So y'all yeah, we do. Um, our customers go year round and we go year round and we have a whole winter program and we move more of our stuff inside and we've got a 16 by 32 building that we use for a lot of that stuff. But um, our whole thing is designed to be able to go through the winter and keep keep mixing. So what do you do? Um, just blend um, kind of your uh, amendments indoors, and then go ahead and take it all outside to do the large pile mix. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And and we've got covers over the workspaces out there and stuff. But you know, if it's a three foot blizzard or something, we're not gonna whip the guys to get out there. We'll say, take the day off and that's right. And let's pick it up. And that's the nice thing about Colorado is there's always a sunny day coming soon. So, uh, amen to that. That's it. And, and sometimes it's even the easiest when it's all just frozen out there in the winter and you've got everything dialed the way you want it and, and, uh, just make it happen. But we make a lot more soil in the summer and spring obviously is our big real go, go time. Um, and every year, pretty much our our demand kind of gets to our capacity if not exceeds it the last couple of years we've been able to to keep our capacity with with some spare year round and so that's nice um that now Are we have taking orders now for spring oh yeah or you, okay absolutely yeah we've got people putting in orders and just making sure they've got exactly what they want when they want it and like i said this is kind of um custom custom newt season like anybody that that wants that service, now is the time to go take your soils tests and get ready and get with us in the winter while we've got some some extra time and capacity and we'll make you a fancy custom nude as long as you need, you know, enough of it. Those are big mixers. But basically for for farm scale stuff, this is the time. And then we'll do that through the winter. Um, we do a lot of shows in the winter. Uh, and we build machines that winters are our machine building time. We, we get right back to it, get all the welders back out again and go right back into fabricating. Um, and then it really starts building your machines you're saying, or upgrading yep. your equipment for the next season. Okay. Yeah. Just, just building cool upgrades and add-ons and add a conveyor here or something. that's it. Yeah, something, whatever the pinch point, the the thing that slowed us down last season was, we'll figure out a way to fix it and uh, and just get that much better. And we we do typically about, uh, on, on a whole as the company, we've done about a 30% annual growth every year. Wow. Um, we were poised this year to be able to do 100% growth, but then uh, with the whole greater industry, you know, obviously nobody was seeing that. I mean, there were soil companies on the West Slope. I know of at least seven soil companies or on the West Coast that went out of business um, in uh, California, Oregon. Um, we heard Fox Farm laid off a bunch of their staff. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's a, a lot of people are hurt. And so I feel blessed that we were able to at least stay up into the end of levels that we were this year. So thanks to our customers and um but yeah, it makes us feel like maybe we're doing something right here. And uh, well, if family owned businesses, you know, you can kind of trim the fat. Like you're in the trenches every day where these larger brands, they might not know what's slowing down production. You know, they're in their office all day. They don't actually even touch the soil. So uh, there's a there's a big disconnect with some of those other brands. Um, and I think that's probably why some of them are failing is because they make certain night. You know, they're good at the marketing. They're good at getting the, the brand out there. But if someone uses your soil and then never wants to use it again, I promise you they're going to tell their homies about that um, because they want to kind of let them know, hey, you know, you can choose to use this. But I, I used it or it's the other way around where you run out of gas. So you spend all this money on a you know a high end engine and it doesn't even, you know, last you 100,000 miles. Uh, there's there's something to be said about that as well. So they can go a lot of, you know, there's almost too many variables to kind of nitpick what could go wrong. Um, so that's why doing your homework, staying on top of things is paramount to find success, uh, whether you're growing in a tent or whether somebody's letting you run an entire facility. True that. 
All right. So um, I was kind of going to allow people to kind of open it up to questions. Um, I was hoping that there was going to be a lot of questions for this one. Um, and then we can kind of tie back in and, and finish out. And um, I was hoping maybe him to pick your brain a little bit more on how uh, people can find ways with IPM. Because I know that you see so many of these larger grows. Um, you know, Marco and I have been talking with uh, some specialists uh, that understand that stuff. But I'd like to see it from your side of things as a, as a soil producer, because I think that's where a lot of those things are coming from. Absolutely. So, uh, Ken, if we have those questions, uh, I guess I should have looked before. Did we watch the whole video? I didn't care. I didn't see yeah, we did. Nice. Well, we've got 11 questions uh, that are standing in the back. We'll try to keep an eye on what is new coming in. Um, now we were talking about wood chips earlier, and I think you were talking about um, the uh, uh, nitrogen uh, fixation of the wood chips if you bury them or something like that. Does this apply with wood chips? Uh, are you talking about the nitrogen lockout? I believe so. Yeah, and, and certainly anytime you have a, a large amount of carbon, you can run into this. And I feel like nitrogen lockout is a bit of a misnomer what's really happening is the soil biology, mostly bacteria is like, Hey, we got a bunch of carbon. I know what I need to process this. This is that's nitrogen. And so it's going to steal it from your plants. It's going to take all the available nitrogen in the soil. And, uh, and, and you're going to obviously have all the signs and symptoms of nitrogen deficiency. So you just have to be really careful to be amending in the right ratios um, some, some type of nitrogen. And of course, um, I'm a pro proponent of amino nitrogen, not nitrate nitrogen. And, uh, and so, yeah, that'll happen with wood chips as well. If you're not amending some other nitrogen source. And it's one of the reasons I love Hugel culture and Hugel mounds. Um, if you guys are familiar with those with like logs in the middle and then sticks and all that. But I, I often see as that wood decomposes, um, nitrogen deficiency symptoms in Hugel mounts. And so in the same way, if you layer in like a, uh, some sort of either feather meal, bone meal, blood meal, um, you can do it with alfalfa meal, but it's kind of tough. Uh, if you're really trying to do it vegan, you'd maybe use bean meal or something like that, like a soybean meal or a, um, our amino pro product is a cracked peas are good too. Pinto peas, beans, I've seen yep. Pinto bean compost, all that. So so any any nitrogen like that's gonna gonna avoid that nitrogen lockout, which is really just nitrogen deficiency because it's been stolen by bacterial organisms. Well, they do need it to build their cell structure as well. So that's it. Okay, so how about hydro system keeping the PPM under 100 parts that affect the microbes and everything else? Hmm. Well, I mean, hydro stuff's kind of crazy. Uh, and I don't run into too many people trying to do uh, uh, organic hydro. It happens um, and you can do it, but you're, you're going to be way better off trying to work in soil. Do you guys have any thoughts on what they're asking there? Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I, there's definitely, um, you know, people are finding six, some people are finding success that way. Um, but I think if you're thinking long term, there's just going to be too many pest pressures with that uh, when you're comparing that against building an actual soil system, the stomach, if you will, of the plant. Um, it, it's almost like a, to me, it's like a cheating the system a little bit. I mean, it's not cheating, but, you know, it's, it's feeding it with like an IV drip instead of being digested. Um, and you had mentioned like different um, nitrogens that's being broken down. All that stuff really matters uh, when you're really trying to build that diversity. Um, and I don't I don't personally think that you're going to achieve that or there's very few people that are going to be able to achieve uh, success, especially perpetual success uh, using that method. I'm not saying it can't be done, um, but you're going to really have to have one hell of a skill set to, to really keep. You know, keep the flips, keep the, the plants healthy, where if you're newer to this, you're just basically relying on Mother Nature uh, and you're maybe, you know, making a few adjustments here and there, but you're kind of staying out of the process. And that's, I think, what we're really trying to teach everyone is Mother Nature figured this out. She's, she's got it. So the less that we interfere, 
I think, especially at the beginning when you're getting into this, the more success you're going to find instead of fucking up flip after flip, paying bills uh, and not having any money when you're supposed to be, you know, you're dreaming of fast cars and all that stuff and you can't even have it. You don't have any money to pay Excel because you, you had two bad flips in a row. Uh, that, that's a kick in the teeth that I hope none of you ever experience. And the wife just came down and told me it wasn't hydro, it was hybrid system. Yeah, hybrid right. system. Hybrid, I, I yeah. saw that, but I think that's what they're talking about is a, yeah, a hybrid too. hydro system. So, yeah. yeah, just using microbes, but still having those synthetic salts. And I think Layton's gone into, you know, there's probably 10, 15 different episodes where he's discussed those kind of things. Uh, and it kind of is a catch 22. As things start to build up, then you're adding those salts things died back down. Um, again, the Debo's seem to emerge. So the diversity is not going to be there uh, unless you're really on top of it. And again, uh, that's a skill set that you have to achieve. You're not going to be able to, most people aren't going to be able to read a few books and, and just be able to find success that way. That's it. Yeah, you're that's, working that's against yourself. So. Easy. You know, that's the thing is I want that system to work for me. Right. Because I'm lazy and I got other stuff to do. You know, that's like, it. like there's more projects, there's more experiments, yeah, right? Once right. you kind of had that going, uh yeah, you you're trusting the process and you're realizing that especially today, man, driving and seeing the mountains, it's figured out. Like there's not there's you unlock the code. All, but there's no huge diversity when when you know, man isn't interfering. Um, and I think that's something in the back of your head that I think a lot of you newer farmers, especially ones that want to get into it for next year, kind of learning this year. Um, I would trust Mother Nature over over you. And I know sometimes the ego, that's, that's kind of hard. But, uh, yeah, she's got it. And if you can just tap into that and improve on those things, you're going to be miles ahead of someone that that really thinks that they're going to mix the, the perfect pH and have the perfect PPM every single time and uh, here's the caveat with that or tell someone else to be able to achieve that um, you know if, if they're having a, a team it's very it's very hard to find individuals where you say like hey do this ABC and they hear you and follow that ABC um, you know that takes time and again if there's high turnover you have to go through that shit every other month or two you're not going to grow good cannabis no that's it and I think you really hit the nail on the head with the like ego and and i think that's where all these things like hydro and you know i've done it and uh and where like biochar and we just always think there's some other super duper tech magic humany thing that we're going to cook up that this is the silver bullet that digs us out and really the silver bullet is just looking in that forest floor at all those silver bullets that are laying there there's a trillion of them you just have to be willing to willing to look. So, agreed. Yep. Okay. So the next one um, is it tied up in bacteria? I think we were that was when we were talking about uh, the different nutrients being tied up. Um, hey, family, let's work on some complete sentences out there. Like, you know, like you know, work, work with us here. Help. <laughs> Yeah, is what tied up in bacteria? Probably nitrogen, I'm guessing. I was, yeah, that's what I was, yeah, I was uh, back in that time when we were talking at the beginning. Yeah. Okay, because then there was all the potassium stuff too. You know, the overabundance of potassium is, is in was one thing, and then there's yeah the nitrogen lockout, which is consumed by bacteria if you don't have enough nitrogen and too much carbon, and. I guess the flip side of that's if you have too much nitrogen, the microbe, the bacterial organisms vented as ammonia gas. So that's why raw chicken litter smells the way it does. That's kind of an interesting um, little tidbit. Smells like shit. Yeah. It smells like <laughs> shit. <You're> horrible. <laughs> and that's ammonia. Don't yeah. be downwind of a chicken farm, man. That is one of the worst smells you ever smell. That's so it. We were talking about uh, how to get uh, uh, really bad soils. You're talking about a sports field. Uh, and somebody went uh, in the desert. So can this be done in a desert um, using your methodology and your products to bring a desert back to green? Absolutely. Yeah. And we see it out here like uh, at the, the conference in Delta um, two years ago, one of our resellers, Jackson's Living Soil, 
they gave, uh, we give away a ton of samples. The old guy took some of our longevity mix. Um, and he'd been trying for 30 years to grow a lawn literally in probably one of the hottest, driest deserts in Colorado could never make it happen and put this out. And there was a four square patch of perfect green lawn in this desert ecosystem. And, uh, and to me, the most, you know, there are a bunch of factors. It takes the minerals, it takes the pH, but it also um, takes uh, the organic matter. And that's where all the water holding capability of the soil is, is in that organic matter. And so, you know, if you can go from one to two, 300%, you go from two to four, that's another 300% water holding capability go from four to eight, another 300% water holding capability in a dry world. Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? And why would you just keep burning organic matter out of your soil and your lawn? Yet when you drive through Kansas or Texas and you see those thousands of rows of corn, that is literally what they're doing. They're, they're doing hydro in the top six inches of sand and just pumping, you know, ammonium nitrate or, um, anhydrous ammonia something like that for their nitrogen component into that hydro and they've got a six inch tillage pan so the roots hit the hard clay they stop they're doing hydro in six inches of sand and calling it agriculture and i think it's insane and i think we need to get away from that in a good organic farm you can plunge your arm into your elbow because of the organic matter yeah it just slides right in that's weird. exactly so yeah, that's kind of where we're like weird with our lawn mix. We have organic matter in the lawn mix. Um, we have all the 22 other ingredients. We've got calcium, magnesium, trace minerals, um, but we do have a lot of nitrogen in there. Lawn slub nitrogen, and that's all amino-based nitrogen. Nice. Do you? So I guess you do orders. You do like? Um, would you ever do like construction where new construction now landscaping comes in? We need six inches of topsoil or whatever. Are you into that kind of? Yeah. Um, like the Denver Federal Building's landscape is in our stuff. As Brian was saying, Cherry Creek Mall, their flower beds and all that are in. That shit's. I mean, Cherry Creek has got. It has to be perfect, and that shit is beautiful, man. Yeah. So we do a lot of that, and so like prior favorite um, for perennials, it's really important with our mixes to understand they're kind of like low, medium and high. And our featherweight champion is our low mix. And we use that for house plants. You know, house plants are low feeders. They they were selected because of that so that you can kind of forget about them and they'll survive one way or the other. Um, you put house plants in the bomb, they're going to croak and die in five days. Uh, but Featherweight works great for that, and it works great for trees and shrubs, native um, native perennials. All those types of things are low-feeding plants. And then the cut flower mix is kind of the mid-strength. Um, that's all the bulbs, and this is bulb time of year. You want to treat your wife, get her a bag of cut flower mix and plant a bunch of bulbs with her, and next spring that'll pay huge, huge dividends. You'll have some awesome stuff happening. And then the, the high feeder mixes come into play, the bomb raised bed mix. And um, some people use those in landscaping, but not as much. Um, they're really for planting veggies in or hemp or any type of cannabis. And um, they're a very potent mix. Um, so it's what's cool about Albrick though. If you, once you get that, yeah, the, the nitrogen, you need to adjust it a little. But in general, as long as you're in ratio, you can cover a whole wide range of plants. Um, and so that's what we're doing there is, is and, and why we've got those kind of specific blends in that way. Well, that's really good because a lot of people need to make their wife really happy, you know, and that makes the wife happy. Nice flowers, you know. That was that's a it. Goal for <laughs> it's the game. Yeah. Now, um, can discarded mash and grains from a distillery be used um, in your compost style system? Absolutely. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people use it successfully. I just don't have access to any of that in a large enough quantity. That's the thing when you need, you know, semi after semi after semi, you really have to, this becomes part of your thinking. What can we get um, on a consistent 
scalable long-term basis but on a small basis grains are great and um, make a really great compost feedstock and just once again check your carbon to nitrogen ratio but really compost is is so simple there's only four things you need to make a great compost and it's air water um, the feedstock and carbon and you you've got all those things nitrogen carbon air and water you can make great compost and yeah, some when, of the guys oh sorry go ahead marco no, not at all just when i when somebody's not able to make their compost go it's one it's usually water but it's one of those four things that's missing and so just squeeze it until the the water barely drips out but not past that um you won't go anaerobic there and you'll have plenty of water to get done what you're trying to do yeah Top. people are usually over water mm -hmm. this is the biggest problem i've seen then it goes anaerobic smells horrible all that yep nightmare so a couple of the guys are asking different components uh dolomite lime and uh insect frass yeah we use a lot of dolomite dolomite's great it's um by itself overly high in magnesium um but it, it's a great component for that and as long as you have some other calciums you're working to keep everything in ratio with dolomite's great insect frass is cool but i haven't gotten the mega results out of it that i had kind of hoped at one time um, and that's the thing that happens to me a lot because i have all the biology and i've got a lot of organic matter like a lot of other methods that might win because they increase those things we've already got them so we don't see this big increase and insect frass is one of those that I, I just haven't been able to get a concrete gain in my output on top of the other things that I'm already doing. I certainly think that if you've got like a dead field or something out of whack and that insect frass that you're using has those elements in it, it can be super beneficial for sure, no doubt. Um, but uh, so I'm not against insect frass and it's, it's once again, it's kind of like our compost. It's kind of like KNF. What we're doing here is we're we're looking at ways that nature bioconverts minerals and elements, and they uh, insects insects are pretty powerful at doing that at taking one type of of material and turning it into another. I think insect frass is great to kind of just build up that diversity too. add a little, a little bit of protein. You've heard me talk about the chitin from it. Uh, so if you're if you're really trying to build your decomposers, I think that's where you're really going to, to find success. And I'm using that obviously to build up every one of mine. Um, and then I've I've also seen a, a dramatic difference from going from the cricket to the black soldier fly, uh, which obviously I learned from Marco. So I think the quality of some of the stuff that you're using when you're talking frass, that matters as well. And if you're using cricket, that's the bologna, man. And we don't eat bologna sandwiches around here. For sure. And I probably need to come back and try some of your frass. <laughs> Definitely. Black yeah, the soldier. black soldier fly is some good stuff, man. Nice. Well, you're also getting all the components the in insect needs to rebuild another insect. It's like feeding plants plants, feed the insects you want to grow, the insects and the components they need to grow. There and, you go. I, yeah. and I don't know if this is, I, I think it's true, and I think there's some writings on it, but just the component of insects, frass, plant relationship, meaning now is plant getting a little stressed or thinking, oh, insects are attacking, mm -hmm. let me beef up. You know, it's my opinion that I think that is true. Um, what do you think, Bart? Um, yeah, well, I, you know, once again, insect frass isn't a place I've put much of my, um, in-depth research, but I've, I've definitely seen, um, amazing things with, with bugs, bioconverting things. And I think this is, it, to me, one of the coolest things I ever saw was, um, a tote of some feather meal that got wet and the flies got into it and they, they, um, made this this output that was completely different from what we started with and because they were trapped in there yet had food and water they could um grow on so, and we we filled basically a yard bag full of flies um and so it's even a whole different thing than the frass in a way it's like the flies bodies but it 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 was amazing stuff like 
I, I trialed that and yeah. So um, I, I think there's a whole world in um, basically entomological bioconversion that holds a ton of promise and I wish I knew more about it. And it's, it's an area that I'm planning on studying, frankly. So. Oh, well, that's good. Gold bar right there. That is the next, you know, kind of me, the, the, the next frontier, you know, going deeper using different specific insects or different specific biology to kind of do specific things. I think that's, we got a lot of, a lot to learn about that. And, uh, yeah, man, uh, black soldier fly. Usually, a lot of people say in Colorado they won't populate, but you know, all on the East Coast they will. If you put out a band with some, they populate my basement, dude. <laughs> oh, did they, now did you get them hatching out of there? Hell yeah, man! My <laughs> wife came down. What the hell? <laughs> I said we're experimenting, baby, and this got out of hand a little bit. <laughs> well, see, here's the here's what I wanted to see from you is now throw those in with the um with the bearded, and now maybe you're getting that hatching, eating that flying insect kind of in the same pit. Yeah, I, th I definitely threw them in there, um, and when they a lot of them were dead, and I just threw them in there. So the isopods that were in his tank, they were eating on that. I started to throw a little bit of the grass seeds, some different seeds. So now that there's actually like things growing out of that, he can eat the grass in real time, uh, which seems like you know it's taking it to the next level because I'm feeding that calcium. So the grass is growing through that, and then it's like another little hiding. It's almost like a world upon worlds when the no grass way. is growing because everybody can hide uh, and feel safe. So that allows the beardy to uh, like really take his hunting to the next level. And I think if you're going to uh, use a beardy as some part of your IPM protocols, uh, you know, take the extra steps to build him a, a living soil, a bioactive uh, tank whatever you want to call it, uh, but make sure that it's kind of a closed loop system. And you'll see, you can see it on the animal's face. It's just, he just perks up, man. Life, life is so much better when they can hunt. If they, in, if they only eat something that's alive and that's what a bearded dragon, they won't e eat anything that is uh, deceased. Mm. Yeah. You feel bad for some of those enclosed, you know, animals, they feed them with like pincers, like every time, like you're just eating a worm on a, a pair of tweezers, like, you know, yeah, man. We're all about that. Give him that whole life, give him that whole experience. And that's going, you know, it's just going to be better for him and, just just a better mindset you know when you think like that and that's your ace in the back pocket man if so, if there is a breakout or all of a sudden holy shit there is black soldier fly everywhere yeah let let a bearded dragon in a couple hours and that shit will be gone i promise <laughs> nice. they can even like puff out their stomachs and it looks like they can continue to eat the same way i try to do on thanksgiving you know just keep it going um, but they're they're able to 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 really eradicate things, um, and chickens do the same thing for outdoor farmers. Mm -hmm. So indoor, I would go obviously with a beardy. Outdoor chickens, um, I think there's a lot of joy in even kind of raising chickens, healthy chickens. Again, that you you're gonna want to you know do some research on the species. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, some of those higher end ones that Jet House and a few others were talking about. I've done a, a some research on those. I definitely want to dive in when I get to the ranch and those kind of things. Uh, but I do think you'll find joy in um, maybe animals you thought were kind of stupid. Uh, you might realize that they're actually hugely beneficial in, in killing grasshoppers and like mm -hmm. things that are so annoying. Chickens just ter terrorize. Especially if you grow cannabis too, you know, they're good to have around. They eat caterpillars, they eat bugs. They just, they're just all around good, good. Yeah, grasshoppers. Cleaners. That's what, yeah. at least in Colorado, man, that's what everybody's dealing with. It's crazy out here. And yeah, my place um, has a lot of mantis on it and the mantis really have done a good job at, uh, mm -hmm. at kind of being the defender against these big gnarly grasshoppers. Well, uh, you might as well have said, I got ninjas protecting my property because <laughs> that's what those things are. Man. Yeah, they yeah. are. They are. Yeah. When we were filming that video yesterday, there was one on the soil line trying to fight the totes coming out of the mixer. Uh. <laughs> like, sorry, little buddy, move out the way. Okay. I think you got to get a screen door on the inside of the house, Brian, going into the basement, and then the wife won't ever see them, right? <laughs> no. I, I don't care. Be, it's not, beat me up. <laughs> yeah, it was like a six-hour problem. But, but yeah, that's what I'm saying. Be able to have those uh, methods or know how to, to solve those issues. And to be honest, since I've been using the Black Soldier larvae, like the Japanese magic potions, some of the ones that really it's hard for uh, my competition to get that coloring to come out. I think it's the chitin. 
I, I you know, nice. I don't have any, yeah, but I, I think that is part of my success and like crab meal and, and again, different sources, but the insect frass, crab meals, uh, those kind of things are, are taking it to the next level. So if you're just trying to build up your worm farm, using isopods and worms, worms love the, the grit of the crab meal, the eggshells, uh, all that is a symbiotic uh, force to be reckoned with once it, once it really starts to pop off. You always need all of the nutrients and all of the building components for the animals, for the plants, and for us. If you don't have them, you found out yourself, you don't have those vibrant colors. And now that you've added them in, now you've got that. That was kind of a gold bar too, Brian, because like you almost got into where you tailor your own worm castings in a custom way, you know, because if you think about it, you build a worm bin, the only thing that they get is what you put in it. So on a small scale home uh, grower, you know, build a worm bin, only throw specific things in this bin and see what you get and do another bin, only throw, you know, different types of inputs, you know, rock dust in one and leafy in another, you know, just kind of mix it up. And I think, you just build that diversity even more, you know? Yeah. And if, if you're new to this, I wouldn't use the scraps, the food scraps, how they're telling you. I think it would be more like kind of what Bart was saying, where you maybe just use like plant material mm -hmm. uh, and, and figure it out. Cardboard, those kind of things. If you are adding a lot of greens, I found more success when I add just a little bit of the browns just to mix them up. I would like put it through a, a shredder. You can get it off his depot. Um, cause I found more success when I added greens, just a little bit of Brown seemed to kind of soak up any little extras. And I was obviously making a lot of mistakes back then. I mean, those mm -hmm. were, that was a long time ago, to be honest, but to, to really build up the, the vermicomposting bins, um, I've never seen anybody fail at that other than maybe they forgot to water, you know, I mean, those are, or trying overdoing to kind of it, things. you know, yeah. too much food will do it. And that usually just comes from when they're doing like the food scraps. So if you yeah. just kind of stay focused, you're adding amendments and not adding your constant food from your family. Um, and then in time, you can obviously do composting in that way. But uh, most people, when they get into compost, they're into it for a few weeks. They kind of forget about it. Um, and then you got fungus gnats through the roof or something. So I don't want you guys to fail. And I don't want your wife or your, your husband to, you know, because fungus gnats, man, when they are taking off are white flies, thrips. I mean, that it almost looks like a horror film when you pop up in that tent and you don't really know what you're doing yet. Uh, they fly out at you. They fly in your mouth. Uh, yeah. You will never forget that. I promise you, if you open up a tent, and <laughs> they fly in your mouth. Uh, so to <laughs> yeah. minimize that stuff, you have to be on point and uh, IPM and all of those things and not wasting money on some of the predatories here in Colorado that probably are effective for Marco aren't going to be effective for Bart and I. So you got to understand that kind of stuff because humidity plays a huge role, especially relative humidity plays a huge role when you're talking predatory mites. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, so to yeah. get back to some questions, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why we took an hour. We got an hour because I figured these would go deeper. Yeah. So um, JDN Canadian uh, was wondering if you use tarps or burlap to cover your piles uh, at all. Yeah, uh, when we are going to tarp them, we do use uh, um, some poly tarps. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of the time, we like to leave our piles open. And the moisture in the winter, you know, we've got our, our big ditch. We've got a half million gallons a day of ditch water um, and a big old pump. What is uh, What was that old game with the gravity gun, uh, like Fallout or something? My buddy says our pump looks like it came from Fallout. It's like a 70s big six inch 70s pump with a big uh, gas engine on it and uh, uh, we'll do that all the way through till the ditch is shut off and then it starts snowing and that takes over the water for the winter and, and keeping that kind of outside layer moist um, so I really like kind of not tarping my piles really mostly um, you could use burlap but you're you're not going to stop anything from going through that obviously and uh, uh, the, the biology is just going to eat it. It's, it's the same thing as like a wood raised bed or something like that. Somebody's like, oh, I'll make a wood raised bed. And like the next season, all the wood's gone. They're like, where did it go? <laughs> and, uh, and so you got to kind of pay attention to the materials that your biology is going to decompose. So I think burlap would be pretty hard to get any usable 
usable element out of the finished compost here we like to tarp it just to keep any if any weed seeds blew over or anything like that we really like to keep that under wraps like that but the hot compost no i like it out out in the elements myself is that ditch just um are you guys kind of plateaued and is that groundwater just coming through or what's what's, what's with that no ditch? it's it's rocky mountain basically runoff and spring water oh, okay um where we are up here we're kind of at the at really the headwaters of the of the colorado nice. um okay. and so um it's an old decree and this valley is really unique in its kind of gravity-based irrigation system it was around the turn of the century it was put in their old decrees um, and we're really blessed to have enough enough water um, to do what we need to do which which not everybody does and so it's kind of one of the nice things about living here that uh, and and of course not every there are dry properties in the valley and things like that but when you've got the right ditch these are old old ditches and they come come from the river and the river comes from streams higher up and you know areas like uh you know anthracite creek and uh the west muddy um so like grand mesa um the elk mountains things like that are where all of our water comes from is that gold territory or gem territory i know they do a lot of gold and gems out there yeah, there's certainly all of those things in places around here. You know, old mines are somewhat common, okay. um, and uh, and I've I've had friends find gems up on the uh, on the Grand Mesa, certainly in certain places. Um, maybe not quite as much as as some of the stuff over by uh, Salida and whatnot, um, yeah. but uh, but there's a little bit of that stuff out here for sure, and. That's pretty cool. When I drove through Colorado, it's so wild because you just look up in the mountains and there's a black hole, like a little spot up there. And you're like, that's an old gold mine. Like, you know, you see it all <laughs> dotted up in the hills. It's pretty wild. That's crazy. They, where, doesn't where the only gold in, mine work is by like Pikes Peak? Well, there's that whole, uh, the whole thing there in the Cripple Creek area. I can't remember the name of that company, but yeah, they were still pulling millions and millions in gold out of those mines. And I, I remember going up there as a kid. I grew up in Colorado Springs, and there was an abandoned gold mine up on uh, Cheyenne Mountain, like probably four blocks from my house. You could walk to it, and and at that time it wasn't even you know graded over like all the parents. Oh, well, don't fall in the gold mine, you know. Yeah. But yeah, they're sketch, and and it's just crazy thinking about those people at the turn of the century, like battling it out to blast and drill and and dig their way down into the earth to find find these Make resources freedom <laughs> that's it so for out of your mixes can you say which one best fits growing cannabis yeah either either the bomb 50 50 or um raised bed mix just depending on whether you like the perlite or not or you want to go rice holes but those are the two the two mixes oriented in that direction and then the big one is, is there a Brian and Marco discount code? <laughs> hey, what's up, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I sure we can figure something out. <laughs> I would say picking his brain before you buy, that'd be worth worth a uh, discount code right there. He just gave us the discount code, people. <laughs> he gave you the off. blueprint, to be honest. That's right. Exactly. With, the, yeah. with what uh, mice to use and stuff, because I, I know I've wasted probably in the thousands buying the wrong mites and buying ladybugs that fell down and didn't do anything. And there's, there's a lot of trial and error when you were doing this without being able to confidently get on the internet. I mean, there were times you could get on somebody or a VPN, you could get on and try to figure some stuff out, but it wasn't the same way. I would say what in the last like three years, four years, maybe, where it seems like a lot of people, especially after COVID. So that's only what, two years uh, where a lot of the faces uh, are now coming out and, and and talking about this stuff, where beforehand it was on the forums like we talked about two weeks ago. You know, it was practically IC Mag overgrow, and then trying to uh, you know build up the courage to to Google you know how to grow cannabis. You know, and mm -hmm. I think before we realized that we're small fish in this stuff, um, you know, right. it, it was kind of terrifying to even Google that. 
Well, it's like we used to get high times in the brown envelope. You know, you're we always were waiting for that to come in the mail, but they couldn't send it out in anything but, right? Because then you'd be in trouble. That's it. I remember those days. That's yep. where I figured out Cypress Hill came from. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it was silly, too, because you would always have to buy those right next to, like, the penthouses and stuff. Yeah. So you're yeah, like, oh, man. man, everybody thinks I'm over here. I'm just trying to buy my weed magazine. Exactly. Uh, but yeah it was packaged in the same way yeah 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 so crazy so what natural amendments do you add to maintain a lower ph um when i do i you know and, and that's an interesting question because a lot of like living soil people say oh you don't need to adjust your ph um and in a lot of cases that's true the biology can help buffer ph a lot but um i like citric acid and uh and when i need to use that is when i see ph is going above about like seven six seven eight um and this is usually caused by alkaline water or other alkaloids um either from minerals or added to the water and uh and at some point you know acidification is a power of hydrogen essentially um, ponderous hydrogen, I think is where pH came from, if we're going to bust some Latin on it, but, uh, uh, basically like, um, you know, you're the more acidic, once, once you're below seven, you have excess hydrogen. And, um, if the alkaloids are stealing that hydrogen, even if your acidic plant root exudates are, are trying to keep up, at some point, those alkaloids are essentially, in a way, going to just steal those hydrogen ions, and then your your plant can't ever get that toehold. And so, if it's if I'm if I'm rising above seven eight, I like to knock it back down, and a little bit of citric acid, microbially derived, it's organic, um, and uh, and gentle. And out here in Western Colorado, where I've seen ditch water come in at pH eleven, you know they're things are alkali and you'll see just like the old timers will be like alkali flats or alkali salts or whatever. And they're right, but it's not necessarily sodium chloride. It's usually like gypsum or something like that. It's a calcium salt and you'll just see it out in the Dobe clay desert. And, uh, and, and so that's why like people will have calcium deficiency, even though they've got 5,000 or 8,000 PPMs of calcium in their soil because that alkali has it all locked up. And if you can get below that certain level, you know, you don't get have to get to six, five or five, nine or whatever crazy things people do. If you can just get below like seven, four or something like that, then the biology and the plant root exudates can really take off and keep that, keep that set for you. So I'll, I'll send people out with a fertilizer spreader broadcast spreading granular citric acid out here and and the agronomists look at me like i'm insane but you see the result these people get just that like their next season will be so much better you just have to be careful like some people do that and it's so dry out and then all of a sudden it rains like a week later and it's the whole volcano science experiment from third grade their yard just sizzles and pops and they freak out what's going on uh, i don't know and uh and it's just that that hydrogen getting into your soil so uh uh i think it's a great thing and i really like citric acid and i like injection pumps um i don't use a dosatron for newts i use a dosatron for my citric acid cool cool so hawaiian sustainable looks like he wants to start building soil here he's wonders what uh, you would recommend for equipment and advance on com and any advice on compliance with regulations or any tips on SOPs. Those pallet tracks look great. Love uh, of the, or love for the video is out. Of, I know I'm lost. Sorry. Yep. I see it there. That all looks great. Yeah. Um, obviously pallet, pallet rollers are a huge part of what we do here. Um, I've had to kind of in, invent my systems. You can go out and buy it. Like you can go out and buy a 15 yard ribbon blender, but on the use market, it's probably going to be 80, $90,000. So, you know, if you, if you're good at machining and welding and fabricating, like just start looking around for things that look 
like the right shape. Um, and, and I do like Mitchell Ellis. I, and, and I've got, I've got used equipment of, of most different brands. We've got a big, um, uh, a 120 yard or cubic foot, um, Bolden and Lawson Pete bail breaker. Um, that thing does fine. Um, but, uh, uh, really be creative if you can. I, I think there's a whole world of, of reusing other equipment from other industries, um, and bringing it into your own. And, and that's how you can try to be profitable is, is, um, and, and also save the planet. And in Hawaii, I would be looking at the sugar cane. Um, there was so much sugar cane world in Hawaii and all of it died when it went to like Costa Rica or some trash. And, uh, and all of that moving sugar is going to be the same, about the same thing as moving soil substrates. So you're going to find a lot of good conveyors, a lot of good, uh, uh, equipment like that. But you just, the main thing is to make sure it's gentle on the soil. That's especially if you're doing living, living stuff. Well, you had even said that you found uh, one of your conveyors at like a used bookstore. So you got to really think it, you know, you got to really think it. Yeah. Uh, book warehouse. It was a book conveyor. That one that was dumping oh, the core blocks, that little guy. Um, yeah. It hauled books from somewhere to somewhere and they had the motor on the bottom, not on the top and bought that thing for a couple hundred bucks on Craigslist. My dad brought it out from the Springs and we got it all tuned back up and that thing's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's it's cool. MacGyvered out, but it's, it's solid. You know what I mean? And I think that's what you want, right? Your equipment to work. Mm-hmm. That's it yeah, for yeah. sure. And there are a lot of things that we can only do when we MacGyver it. Like when you buy a piece of equipment, you get what you get. And even that Mitchell Ellis, we've had to heavily modify it. Like there were things about that, that I've, I've grumped and cursed Mitchell Ellis, you know, the Hmm. the shaft in the middle used to always slide out the side of the bearing. So we had to tap the bore and tap the center of the shaft on that thing and put stops and like Hmm. it's tuned up and, and all our stuff tuned up. And that's why, we can do some more stuff is because we took some extra effort and then you can customize it to just the way you want it. And then you can do some magic. So, yeah. um, it's have you know. an open mind, you know, like when, go, when I see something, I don't see it as what it is. I see it as what I can use it for. Like, you know, but, and that's just having an open mind. Well, it's using your available materials to create what you need in order to, to move forward. Definitely. So waggle dance, and that's a B reference, um, are the compost and castings adding the microbiology needed for the soils to break down the other ingredients? And if so, how long with a bag or yard or how long will a bag or yard last without reamending it? If you tried water only. Um, no, the composting, well, the compost and castings are adding all the biology. They're not adding all the mineralization. As long as as the environment's right, you don't let it get too hot or too dry or something like that. The biology will keep going. Sure, you can pump it up with a tea. Like I love a good actively aerated tea. Or um, you know, uh, there are a lot of a lot of different. Uh, uh, things that Brian and Marco talk about that can help re-inoculate a soil. But, uh, but in the end, you got to keep that mineralization going. And so, um, you know, most of our stuff, like with veggies, the bomb can grow almost any veggie for a full season, no feed. You could grow 10 rounds of lettuce in the bomb and, and not have to feed anything. Um, with cannabis, cannabis is a very high feeder. And the thing, here's where I like mostly difference from say a coot or a subcool mix or something like that is that, uh, that I don't try to put all the, the biology in. I land somewhere between living organic and super soil and people take me to task for this all the time, but it's just, you know, don't try and put me in a cage. Um, I'm going to do something different and I've always done it different. And I wasn't like kind of a forum guy. I did my own thing and. Um, and so I, I leave the nitrogen purposefully low because when I pump it way up, I start seeing a reduction in species diversity. Um, and, and I can put everything else in there. I can put all your other, um, 
trace minerals, micronutrients, biology, as long as I keep the nitrogen toned down. So I put absolutely as much as I can into, into the bomb, but then that's why you need to supplement a little. And it's a, I think it's kind of a feature more than a bug because if you have a, a certain, a sensitive, a nitrogen sensitive strain, you're not going to burn it. If you, um, and the aminos of course help buffer that too, but really that's the, the magic to me. Also, if I've put like, you know, we were just talking about Marco putting all this work into your fine cure compost. It doesn't make sense to me to come back with one of these mixes and then run the whole thing up to 140 degrees again. There went all your biology. So it's one of the things about our new blend that took me the longest to figure out was how to get all these newts in and then not have it go back up in temperature too much. And we focus a lot of our process in that and having it at the most, hopefully, you know, I'd say 109 is my highest that I ever want to see it go even in the summer. Um, and it's, we, we live right on that cusp um, sometimes when it's hot out for sure. And, and we're making a lot of soil. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's where the magic lies on keeping the species diversity up and, and why you see these customers with these totes. Um, there was a guy that just wrote me on Instagram and he's like, this is crazy. It's gnarly. And the whole top of his tote was full of mushrooms. Um, that's because we could, we could keep that biology alive through that whole process. So, um, yeah, veggies a year with the minerals, uh, three weeks with canna stuff in the bomb and it won't, you won't see a deficiency until week five or six, and then it's only a nitrogen deficiency, but that's the cool thing. You don't have to worry about all the trace minerals, the micronutrients, any of that junk, just focus on your nitrogen and flour and your fa or nitrogen and veg and your foss and flour. Um, and, and the soil handle all the rest of it. Fantastic. You are going to say something, Marco? No, I just said oh. perfect. Oh, oh, that's, I, I saw your lips move and I saw those beautiful <laughs> white teeth shining there. And I was going, okay, Marco perfect. wants to say something. No, no, perfect. <laughs> yep. He's my man's on it. <laughs> okay. Peace of mind farms wants to ask, what's the biggest mistake people make when trying to build their own living soil? What's Good the trust. hype and what's for real? Over compost every time, every organic farm, every like all the time people put in too much compost and scorch everything with potassium. And then I'd say after that, it's just like mineral ratios. And then after that, it's using a window turn compost that's all bacterial. Um, and then it's not putting the right predatory insects in. Um, I'd say those are probably the top things I see that are kind of hard, hard to do right. Yeah, I I've seen agree. too when people buy like uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, like the landfill compost and stuff, uh, they can have problems because they're kind of going super cheap with that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think your quality compost uh, matters. And then of course, as Leighton always says, don't be a moron with any one of these things uh, because there is kind of like a Goldilocks aspect to a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And, and, you know, build in and build in that IPM, like, uh, like Bart said earlier, you know, I like to water in things like BT, you know, um, mm -hmm. to get that, to get ahead of the fungus gnats. Cause usually when you build that living soil, um, you do get that bloom. Um, but if you kind of are proactive and, and build in those, you know, those IPM uh, nematodes mm -hmm. and, BT and those kind of things, you can get ahead of that. So. That's it. Okay, here's one. What can be amended to the soil in veg stage when growing cannabis? Well, Not really anything can be amended in veg stage. Exactly. I mean, obviously, you're going to want a lot of nitrogen in veg. Um, uh, and, and for nitrogen, I either like, like our soy amino or soluble, if you want a soluble, or um, feather meal, fish bone meal, fossilized seabird guano, or no, sorry, uh, um, uh, bone meal, blood meal, things like that, high nitrogen, usually protein-y type stuff. But you want your whole rest of your profile to be in ratio. You can't ignore any of the minerals. So you really, 
you know, when I'm when I'm looking at our thing, I, I end up spending thousands of dollars in tests on every one of our inputs. So I know, you know, this has this much of this and this, and you got to stack it all together. And that's why it's an art. That's why you just can't take 22 random things and throw it together and anything and have it work out. And sometimes I feel like I'm the hammer looking for a nail, but to me, the soil is where it is all at. It's probably 80 or 90% of the game. And, uh, and it's what made me want to do this and why I think it's so fascinating and so important to get the soil right. Um, and people think they'll think, Oh, I've got a black thumb or something like that. I just don't think that exists. I think you just had, had some soil that was out of whack. Um, and you, you get your soil right and everything else will come back, come back into alignment. Definitely. So the next one from Ryan, do you have a high fungal mix for my blueberries? Well, the dynamic uh, is definitely super high fungal and um, all of our mixes have those fungal biologies. The main thing about blueberries is they want it acidic. And um, so you could take, you know, you could take something like the bomb or cut flower mix and just be, um, making sure you're using enough citric acid in it and drive it down. You just got to drive the pH down. And in nature, that's the interesting thing. If you look at a map of precipitation in the U S it's going to I almost identically correlate to a map of pH of the U S places where there's a lot of rain washing through the ground. It's going to be acidic places that are dry desert, like arid, they're going to be alkali and, and you just have to remember that. And that's why blueberries grow in these wet um, areas and why they like acidic areas. That's where they, they grow. So, um, you know, if you're going to take a plant out of its natural environment, you at least have to recreate that environment. And acid is probably one of the biggest factors, in my opinion, in growing blueberries. So, yeah, if you wanted to take something like the bomber cut flower mix, I do have people grow container blueberries in Colorado quite successfully. You just have to make sure you're not watering with your pH nine water or whatever. That's for sure. Oh, most definitely. That'll kill them uh, really fast. So yep. Cheddar Bob wants to know when's your Pania be available in Maine at an affordable Pania, rate? Peonia, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at an affordable, affordable shipping price. Well, I would say when people start sending semis there, we need a we need a group of folks to get together. Um, and say, and we've got some more store that would carry some or, or some stores. Yeah. Any, anyone that'll take it. So go to your local grow store, go to your garden center, go to your, um, or get some farms together or whatever you want to do, you know, but, uh, but get somebody together that'll bring that semi in. And we've got some really amazing local truckers or cowboys that this is what they do. Um, and they move those trucks for cheap. And so, you know, it's expensive to move little bitty quantities of things, but a semi is a pretty efficient way to move it. So, yeah, if you want, you want some reasonably priced soil in Maine, um, pretty much get a, get a group together and put in for a semi load. And Kate, our sales director, does stellar work like putting three, four stores together because we know not everyone can buy, you know, 80 yards a a soil right off the bat or something like that, but get three or four stores together, go in on a semi, split it up amongst your community. And, uh, and that goes a long way to getting that ball rolling, but we support everyone everywhere. So. Um, there yeah. you go, Cheddar, get out there and talk to the stores and ask to bring it well, in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, KTS wants to know what's in the bomb mix. Uh, you can go to the website and you can actually see it right there, but do you want to cover yeah. it a little bit? Yeah, we, we put it all out. Brian's going to get one of our bags here, but uh, you know, of course we start with the peats. Uh, we get into uh, uh, the worm castings, the kelp. Um, yes. There you go. Big four. What's that? One one cubic foot. Uh oh, y'all knocked the mute off. Can't hear you. Yeah, we lost your microphone, guys. There we go. We're back. We're back. All right. 
So yeah, this is a two cubic footer. Oh, two cubic. Uh, oh, big boy. Okay. Yeah, we we uh, we do some ones, but really most people that are buying our stuff are doing doing something something real. Can, can you get the semi broken down in that two cubic foot size? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, no, okay. you can get a semi load of two cubic footers if you want. You can get the bulk bags. Each bulk bag is 13 and a half of these. So that kind of gives you an idea. Times 78, I think you said. Yeah, exactly. It's 26 pallets. So it's 50 of these bags on a pallet, 26 pallets on a truck. You can actually move a little more in the bags than the totes, but the totes are a little bit better price. Um, but here I can read off the rest of these ingredients for you. Um, oops. You're getting your workout today. That's it. That's how we do it. So, um, you know, obviously the peats, then the, the perlite, the compost. Um, and then you get into the uh, worm castings, kelp meal, feather meal, oyster shell flour, gypsum. Dolomite lime, molasses, azomite, fish bone meal, fossilized seabird guano, humate, mastodon pea, uh, mycorrhizal inoculant, green sand, um, citric acid, manganese sulfate, zinc sulfate, potash, and uh, um, boron. Well, that took a while for you to get to do that the right way because that many amendments if it's not dialed in is usually going to cause problems so yeah uh, you know that's a tried and true that's, that's it dialed right there so we yeah. call it dialed in and that's a lot of stuff in that bag and then that's a big <laughs> bag too you guys hear that thud yeah that's yeah. a two the two boy that's the big boy yeah that's it Okay, our, so our what about think we're nuts? <laughs> oh, I'm, I bet, yeah. So, how about just a fungal food or fungal fungal amendments? Any recommendations? Sure, like of course, a lot of fungal organisms like wood. Um, you know, like if I'm making a tea and I want to push it more fungally um, directed, I would use like a fish hydrosolid or something like that. Um, and and just like, um, you know, almost anything can be decomposed by a fungal organism. It's, it's shocking. I mean, certain fungal organisms can eat radioactive waste and, um, that King's Trefarious, uh, garden giant mushroom is one of the only things that can break down persistent herbicides. And like when Brian was talking about compost problems, um, that's one that pops up is, if you've got like amino pyrrolid residue that came through from the grain through the animals, um, it's one of the only chemicals that the compost decomposers can't break down. And so if you've got amino pyrrolid or Roundup in um, uh, like in that compost, that's going to kill all the, all the plant, you know, it's, and, and so amazingly somehow those things can even still be a food for a fungal organism so really almost anything but i do love wood and wood and uh and fish products to some degree for for culturing certain fungal species leaf mold is a good one too yeah. uh, nice leaf, power. leaf mold can is always beneficial there you go now taylor s has a random question he says I have I keep heavily planted aquariums which require fertilizer. Would watering my soil with aquarium water that contains fertilizer hurt my soil biology? It uh, it's mostly sulfates. Probably to some degree. Yeah, I, I would think so too because those are those are two different worlds. But again, that's the whole point of the fun of it is maybe you should try it then. Let us know. Yeah, you know, I, I think why from you a gotta feed your aquarium, fertilize your aquarium. Must have plants in it. Then. Yeah, I think they're having plants in it. Okay. Well, you Something should. Like well, I'm not going to tell you that, but fish <laughs> poop will feed the plants. So maybe focus a little bit on that. You can get away from the chemicals there too. I have a, a 150 gallon <laughs> aquarium, and I don't use chemicals. You know, so they're not necessary um, in an aquarium setting either. 
Well, I know I used to do aquaponics and using the, the fish manure was what was feeding the plants and then the plants cleaned the water to give back to the fish. So it's a, a natural cycle. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it could add some diversity, I think. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. I think there could be some benefits to the diversity, but usually when people get kind of gung ho on that, they add a little too much. So that's why I would add that caveat is I would, I would be, they, I would be they cautious. Do you need to talk to Leighton about something? Yeah. Well, he would also be better to answer that question. Um, no, he'd tell you to pour that fish waste them. right on there, but not with the sulfates. Right. Yeah. If yeah. it yeah. didn't have the sulfate. tell you my fish brew is what he'd tell you. Dude. Yeah, he'd tell you to get fish <laughs> brew and tell us about that, which is and a good It's kind of interesting because like a lot of the people out here try to use sulfur to combat alkalinity, but then you go sulfur toxic. And I think that's mm -hmm. what you're going to end up doing there is just building your sulfur soil sulfur levels to the point of toxicity and it's tough like sulfur is a hard thing to get to toxic levels no doubt but there is a threshold and once you go past it it ain't gonna work right you're toast once you go past it and then don't all sulfates kind of compound to ultimately be that sulfur to get you into that toxicity yeah. it's my experience that's what yeah. Um, Harley Smith, I think, uh, who's with MPK Industries. I think he has a few videos on that even. Um, cool. That's where I learned that from. Yeah. Yeah. So we got one last question, guys, right at the three hour mark here. Uh, can rooted or rooted cuts go straight into full strength soil? Yep, absolutely. The bomb, you can, you can plant seeds or cuts right into the bomb. You'll get super high germination rates um the cuts love it it's specifically designed in that way and that's that's why i keep my nitrogen dialed back just a little bit is so you can put a cut right into it and you know we've had there there are years in colorado in the hemp era where we had um i think one year we had over 10 million cuts in our soil in the state of colorado mm. and they had in the high 90s you know 99 point something percent success rate with with all those starts um and and most of our growers that's what they're doing they're going straight into the bomb the only thing i wouldn't use the bomb to try to root a cut directly i'd use something else for that but once it's got roots stick it in there and run it yeah fantastic and that's it guys it's three hours and one minute <laughs> Well, uh, I, I do want to, uh, Marco, uh, we've been doing this for a year now, buddy. Uh, last year, I think, oh. was like official. Whoa. Um, oh, happy so, anniversary, guys. Thank congratulations, you. boys. Yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> so it's been it's been awesome, dude. The fact that, you know, you're showing up unless we're in timeout, uh, you know, each and every week. You know, I don't think most of our viewers understand the work that goes behind the scenes. Uh, and I believe, Ken, we've been, uh, you know, four or five months. Uh, so yeah. time has been flying by. I appreciate you as well, sir. And I just wanted to put that out there. It's been uh, it's been a year. So uh, yeah, it's been cool great, man. It. It's been fun, man. I, I, you know, sometimes I'm like, man, I'm so busy. Can I do this? Can I keep going? But then somebody hits me up, man, are y'all doing the show? We want to see y'all. So it's like, I'm going to be here as long as I don't have another commitment as far as on a week by week basis. Um, and hopefully we can hit every week like we should. But you know, when when you got you got things to do, you got to do them. You know what I mean. So, well, luckily, hey, we're putting good karma out there. You're, I know you're taking off. You got all that stuff. Um, and you know, I'm I'm driving down here because we got other stuff going on. And right. I, I think I think the reality is is that uh, good things are coming from this show. Uh, and I'm proud to say that we're not sponsored or anything. Uh, and I like that, Marco. I think at first we were maybe toiling with that, but it's sponsored by uh, by Marco and myself, uh, yeah. Ken and uh, and Peter. Congratulations, yeah. guys. Yeah, that's Appreciate awesome. That, man. Yeah, and it's been kind of cool, dude. You, it is. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. why I like hanging out with you because you're sincere about what you do. You want to help other people. I saw that about Marco when we were out in Tulsa. He he has those same same um ideals and not not everybody does these days so nice work boys and way yeah. to stick at it i'm glad he agreed to be the a co-host man i think this is know, a great idea. Have this show on thursday uh but but this show is different man with, with the way that you're bringing it so it's like we kind of have two shows but at the same time not really because 
it's just a totally different show uh, having you, Marco. Um, so you know, I, I just Thanks, buddy. yeah, man. This is this has been a joy, and I've learned so much. And I know my business is taking off because I'm sitting here with you boys each and every week. So I appreciate that. And I guess in a way, I'm also getting uh, getting things out of this uh, just by the education alone. Yeah, it's, we get uh, three hours of learning every week. And then, like, you know, we're, that's a lot of time. It adds up. I haven't done the math, but, you know, we've done three hours and a lot of shows. And over time, that's all. I tell my wife, shoot, I'm I'm on here. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing people on that I can learn from, you know, I'm selfish. Hell yeah, you always wanted to ask them questions and stuff. Yeah. You know, you just bring them on and then you just get to ask them. So that's exactly. cool. Well, and that's why I'm doing this. You know, I don't want any money because my money is the education that I receive every time I do one of these shows. You guys are absolutely amazing. Yes, sir. Nice. Well, we'll keep it going. Shit. There ain't no, no need to stop it now. So, Brian, you got anything that uh, you have coming up you want to talk about? Uh, tomorrow, you know, I'm, I'm hanging out with, with Bart for a couple of days. So tomorrow, uh, we'll have, uh, Bart back if he wants, but we, we also have Alex who, um, you know, it's been, it's taken me a couple of weeks. And again, with last week, uh, being in timeout, moving things around, uh, but, but Alex is, uh, teaching on a, on a different level, man. And there's so many topics out there that I know most people would never touch with me. Uh, and Alex is willing to, to talk about those things. So we're going to talk about something called the Bilderberg Group. Um, it's something that's near and dear to me. I have gone down the rabbit hole many nights, you know, enjoying cannabis, sometimes some mushrooms uh, and finding out about who in a way might actually really run this world and, and why they meet in secret. Uh, and I think there's a lot to learn about that kind of stuff. So we're having Alex on again. Um, and I, again, we appreciate your feedback with this kind of stuff. You know, we, we we're trying to have shows, obviously, with cannabis, uh, but I think we need to learn about uh, a few other things in life so you kind of understand more about how, I the guess, in my works. opinion, how the world really works. Uh, and following, if we're following Mother Nature, then, you know, if we're also trying to figure out how things work, we need to find out about what what is the, you know, the real elitists, you know, what, what are they actually doing? And this is uh, something that's been around for 50, 60 years. I mean, this isn't. This isn't it's been new. around forever, though, too. You know, even before the yeah, this mystery group, schools, there was yeah, always man. a group, mm-hmm. and it's always the super rich that get to learn this stuff. So that's why I'm glad that that Alex is willing to break this kind of stuff down. Is you know, it's like the the poor, the middle class. We just kind of like dismiss all of those things. Uh, but back in the day, I mean, there was a lot of like astrology, and I, I mean, even I almost kind of giggle when I talk about some of that stuff still to this day. Uh, but that's why I love kind of talking about this stuff is there was a, a real view, uh, especially with leaders, um, you know, that there was something to the metaphysical. And there's obviously something to it when the the richest and the most powerful individuals uh, talk about those things. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Educate yourself, people, you know, yeah. take, take it all in and then make your own decisions about what you think is, is what. Yeah. And, and, you know, if if all these, you know, if, if 100 of the most influential people met every year and you knew about that and there was a total media blackout, you know, would you want to know why is that? And that's what's been going on with the Bilderberg Group forever mm-hmm. is that they all meet in secret. Um, they're supposedly it's off the record. So they get to talk about, you know, some people even say some vile stuff where they you know, they say some people believe that the, the planet's overpopulated. Some people believe that there's not enough uh, population. Um, you know, there's a whole view that like the Japanese, um, they don't procreate anymore. So there's a view that they're, you know, there's just so much into it. And that's what the Bilderberg Group uh, kind of talks about. They, they, you know, they are the ultimate think tank. I mean, yeah, y'all are going to have a good time, but it's shit like, you know, making men less masculine, like putting all this shit out there in society <laughs> where people are like, you know, letting their guard down. There's a lot to it, guys. Jump on in there and check them out. I'm, I'm versed on it, but I might stop by just to listen in because it's always fun. And it's always shit that makes you think like, damn, really? Yeah. Like, really? You know, so. And then Alex backs it up with facts. I mean, we're not sitting here talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, no disrespect, but like Sandy Hook or something that obviously is fake. Uh, you know, that's the problem with people that that go on the fringe is like they just keep going on that. And that's the part that I don't like. No. I just want to I want the facts. And that's what Alex is all about. 
That's uh, the other reason. Alex. The Alex. Yeah, not Alex Jones. That's it. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Got the real Alex. I got Alex Ritter. <laughs> Alex Jones. In defense, some of his stuff has been legit, but some of his stuff is complete bullshit, and that's why I hate people that do that because then everybody classifies everything that man says is bullshit, uh, which now it does seem like most of it was just for money. So that's what obviously we don't want to promote. Uh, but the Bilderberg Group isn't a uh, fairy tale. Uh, mm -hmm. These people exist, um, and you should know about it. Real deal. Yeah, Mr. Tate wanted to know if you're ever going to have a, a Patreon so that uh, he can support what we, you guys are doing here. Well, to be honest with you, there's the gratitude and stuff, or what, whatever is being built from this show, I promise you that I'm doing fine, and Marco's doing fine. You know, so if if we need to, I guess, talk about this behind the scenes, but I, I am so blessed with the fact that I can sell sell bugs across the country and people want to buy them. So that that is that is what my Patreon link would be, is that for whatever reason, man, I have tapped into something. And I am so grateful for it. That's why we do this for free is because we don't need that. Um I guess I'm speaking for myself, but I know Marco. He's uh, yeah, my right. goal is to be as successful as Marco. So uh, we we have free time because behind the scenes uh, we work really hard. Um, and if you really want to support us today, buy some soil from this man. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Definitely. If I just uh, mailed you bugs today. No, <laughs> by the way, Word. Now, is that yeah, a good kids. thing or not, Marco? Yeah, I mean, we mail each other bugs and stuff. Yeah, we do. We, yeah. We're chopping it. We're gonna be. Uh, we're gonna be bugs big time. Feature. Yeah, yeah. sorry to cut but, you. Yeah. Imagine if your cannabis seeds could procreate. That's what we're doing. So, yeah. And, yeah. And cheers to you guys for for doing it without the money. And uh, and if y'all want an online place to donate, I'm on the board of directors of a little theater here in Paonia That's on the edge of surviving and it's on coloradogives.org um so i will give a little plug to that because that's kind of the the main um, bastion of lgbtq thinking out here of art of of the things that are important and so that's uh coloradogives.org and it's friends of the paradise theater and if you just do like 10 bucks a month or something like that that makes this place survive and we do living soils talks um it's it's really just a community place to do everything our little community needs and disney has just about squished it so mm. if you want to go sucks. on there give us 100 bucks 10 bucks whatever we'll take it cool. great point we always say it help out where your boots touch the ground you know, you don't yeah. need to look at Brian, us here. We appreciate that, but also help right there in your town. You know I mean? Yeah, keep it local. We appreciate everything. And, uh, you know, Mar to me, Marco is kind of in a way my mentor, man, is because he, he just seems like he always has free time, even though he's constantly on the go. Uh, and that's my goal is to eventually uh, have that free time, but choose to be constantly on the go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. And like you look at Marco's going to be coming on to for my event, donating his time again to help teach people. And that's the beauty of it is if you want to donate to somebody, donate to somebody who's teaching people, whether it's anybody on here or anywhere else. It's that knowledge, the caring, sharing and community and try to spend your money in your community to help the people around you. Boom. That's a good gold bar to finish on right there. <laughs> Do you have anything coming up, brother? Marco? Talking about Bart? I'm good. No. no, I'm good. Um, no. Nope. Hey, other than my event next weekend, don't forget. Yeah. Okay. Sunday. I'm doing it Sunday, the day after my anniversary. I'm on with Ken. You got it locked in if he's thinking anniversary. Yeah, yeah I Your got you tied right day. in on that. Hey, I had to get <laughs> approval from his wife, okay, to allow him this, okay? Exactly. Hey. Okay, and you're probably guys, not as cute. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> we will see you guys all tomorrow. I actually have a private members association meeting that I'm supposed to be in right now. Speaking of the stuff that Brian's talking about, there's a lot of laws and a lot of stuff out there that they don't want us to know about. And, uh, well, how, I, I might ask my girls in the PMA if they'll come on and have a talk with you, Brian, because uh, that's something that's very, very important, something I push. Right on. Yeah. Badass. Okay. 
with that, guys. Cheers, everybody. Good growing. Yeah.